Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor David Kaiser from MIT. Uh, uh, he uh, works on many, many aspects uh, related to cosmology. Uh, particularly, he will talk about a very interesting topic related to inflation today, which is a nonlinear physics at the start at the, and the end of cosmic inflation. And uh, obviously, the nonlinear physics is very interesting to, uh, for us, uh, those who are working in this area. And hopefully, we can learn a lot today from Professor Kaiser. And uh, this is basically the uh, 52nd QASTN Zoominar series. And uh, uh, we are very thankful to having you, uh, Professor, in our forum. And, uh, uh, we are welcoming you uh, from uh, our side, from Potsdam. Okay, so you can start and uh, uh, yeah, so now it's here. Terrific. Well, well, thank you so much. I'm really uh, delighted to be here and I look forward to, to talking with you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We'll get that started. Um, hopefully you can see those slides okay. Um, I have a, a lot of material to talk that I'm excited to talk about with you, but of course, please, please don't hesitate to jump in if you have questions at, really at any point along the way. I'd be glad to pause and, and discuss. Um, so I want to talk today about uh, a few projects that I've had a lot of fun working on uh, in recent uh, weeks, months, and years with a number of students and, and colleagues. Um, and I think there's a lot of really kind of interesting, juicy questions uh, that, that still remain. And there's lots of great topics and great work uh, that, that I think we could all work on together moving forward. So I want to give an overview of some of the kinds of things we've been puzzling through uh, in my immediate group and, and areas where I think there's still uh, lots and lots more that, that together we could try to tackle moving forward. Uh, so uh, I prepared the, the presentation today in, in three main parts. And the first part is meant to be, will probably be familiar. It's meant to be a review, uh, certainly for many uh, listeners, if not for all of them. And I want to go over it anyway, because I think it'll help set up uh, both some of the motivation for the, for the more detailed work to come, but also it'll help establish uh, things like notation and nomenclature and just make sure we're, we're on the same page uh, for, for, for the later parts. So this first part on uh, will be a kind of quick review of some of the main ideas about inflation that people have been thinking about uh, for, for a long, long time. And then I'll talk uh, about two separate research projects I've been working on recently with uh, students and colleagues. Uh, the first is trying to understand what might be a kind of um, before inflation, where we actually have to start thinking quite carefully about uh, nonlinear structure of the dynamics, not just the, the beautiful, very pristine linearized dynamics that work so unbelievably well uh, in this phase. And then uh, for the, for the uh, third main part for today, we'll talk about the physics after the end of inflation, this critical period known as reheating, which again is marked by a variety of distinctly nonlinear processes, again, well beyond the kind of linearized analysis that otherwise works so well up here. And then very briefly, I'll just pause with some uh, near the end with some of my own thoughts about kind of my wish list of things that I hope we can all work to understand even better moving forward. So that's the plan for today. And again, please don't hesitate to, to jump in uh, with any questions along the way. So let's start thinking, why did people begin thinking about things like cosmic inflation? What was this meant to be uh, an answer to? What, what, what questions was this uh, motivated uh, in response to? And one of them had become known as the flatness problem. It's probably hard to see in the slide here. This was actually articulated first by Robert Dickey, the very uh, terrific, uh, cel rightly celebrated cosmologist and, and uh, quantum electronics pioneer. He gave these lectures in 1969, just over 50 years ago. And they were published in a small little book. Here's the, the cover of the book called Gravitation and the Universe, really amazing lectures from the late 1960s. So it was actually Robert Dickey who, to my knowledge, first articulated what we now call the flatness problem. And it went as follows. Consider a, a very simple model of a universe, homogeneous and isotropic. Let's say it has three dimensions of space and one of time. Then uh, there are sort of three possibilities for the sort of shape of such a universe. If it's gonna respect these very specific symmetries, then we could live in a universe that could be represented with a very simple line element here. Uh, here's cosmic time, here's our, our spatial sections, there might be some 
time varying scale factor for the universe, the overall scale could stretch or shrink over time. And it would be stretching or shrinking some um, spatial sections of a particular geometry. And so the three possibilities were all controlled by this parameter capital K. It could be spatially flat and described by Euclidean geometry that we all uh, learn quite young, or we could live in a closed geometry if this parameter K were positive or an open geometry of K were negative. And, th and that was it. Those are three possibilities for a space time that was gonna respect these very specific symmetries of being homogeneous and isotropic. Then we can ask how would such a space time evolve? So let's invoke Einstein's field equations from general relativity. And if we, if we look at the zero, zero component of these tensors, we arrive at what uh, is known as the Friedman equation, which tells us how this scale factor, how this basic size uh, will vary over time. Uh, we introduced this thing called the Hubble parameter H, which is really just the, the rate of change of the scale factor divided by the scale factor itself. And then its change over time is dictated by Einstein's equations. And in particular, it's controlled by the energy density, the average amount of stuff per volume. And then again, this kind of uh, geometrical curvature term of capital K. Well, we can actually, uh, this is now where, where Dickey began um, uh, introducing new ideas here in, in these lectures. We can consider a certain ratio, is now uh, known as by the Greek letter omega, which is a ratio of the actual amount of stuff per volume, the actual average energy density rho, compared to some critical value, the critical value that corresponds to a spatially flat geometry. And if we work in terms of this ratio omega, we can exactly rewrite the Friedman equation, no approximations at all. This expression here is, an exact, is exactly mm -hmm. to where we start. <coughs> the Friedman equation. And so we can look at this ratio for the deviation of omega from this special value corresponding to a spatially flat universe. How would omega differ from one? So we look at this ratio, the numerator is just a constant. K is some number. If we choose appropriate coordinates, we can make it either plus one, minus one, or zero if we measure uh, so, you know, distances in, in convenient coordinates. This, uh, the, the reduced Planck mass is just proportional, inversely proportional to Newton's gravitational constant. These are just numbers in the numerator. So all Dave, the action. I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. The <coughs> introducing this uh, omega parameter is just to write down the equations in a dimensionless form. Yes, that's right, and it's a way exactly. It's a way to 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 characterize um, how close we are to this special case of a spatially flat geometry. It's just a way of parameterizing. Are we are we uh, in do we, are our conditions consistent with this with a Euclidean spatial section or not. And what do you mean by this critical value and is it measured in the present time scale? Ah, it, 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 it depends on the Hubble rate, which itself could change. Yes. So the, the critical so, value here ah, depends okay, on okay. H squared. Yeah, so it's, that's a good question. Thank you, I should have pointed that out. So, so the critical value emerges from, from the Friedman equation. It really comes from saying, if K happened to be zero, which would correspond to the flat case, what is the relation that must hold between the energy density and the, and the expansion rate, the Hubble rate. Okay. So we just rewrite, for the case that K happens to vanish, we can relate the energy density to the Hubble parameter, and that's what we call the critical value, which will hold only in the event that, that K vanishes, which puts us in this spatially flat case. So yeah. now we can consider uh, what are the deviations from that critical value, and so this dimensionless parameter omega helps us kind of uh, characterize, are we near or far from that critical value? Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Good. So now we can ask about how would this, how would this ratio, this dimensionless value, change over time? And as I was saying, it, it will evolve. It's really just rewriting the Friedman equation. So it will evolve in such a way that the numerator of this expression is just a number. It's just a constant. And all the action comes in the denominator. That's where all the dynamics comes in. The scale factor could change over time. The energy density could change over time. If you imagine the volume of space changing, the density should change and so on. So we can now examine how would this quantity evolve? How might we expect it to evolve if the universe were filled with matter that was quite familiar to physicists by the 1960s at the time that Robert Dickey was putting this uh, forward? If this, if this highly symmetric universe uh, were filled with matter that was uh, cold and uh, pressureless, it was filled, if it was filled like a, as a bucket full of rocks, let's say, cold matter, 
uh, then we would expect the energy density to scale with the volume so that the energy density should, should fall as the volume grows and it should scale like the cube of the scale factor. It's a kind of spatial volume. So if we go back and look over here, if the numerator is just a number, just a constant, and the, and the energy density is falling like uh, one over a cubed, then this ratio uh, should actually grow over time in an expanding universe. That is to say, the universe should become more and more different from flat. Omega should, should deviate more and more strongly from one over time if we have an expanding universe filled with cold, ma cold pressureless matter, a, a bucket full of rocks or marbles. And it should deviate even more quickly from spatially flat, Dickey went on to show, if instead the universe were filled with radiation. Radiation, uh, the energy density in radiation will redshift even more quickly than for cold matter. It will fall like, uh, like one over a to the fourth. You have a volume effect plus the redshifting of each of the wavelength of each mode uh, of radiation. So, so typically the energy density uh, redshifts even more quickly in an expanding universe for uh, a radiation-like equation of state. And so therefore, again, if we look at the denominator here, we'd have a squared times one over a to the fourth, the whole ratio here should deviate even more strongly from flat over time, or at least we would expect it to, for this simple universe filled with simple or familiar kinds of matter. And this became known as the flatness problem that Dickey was calling attention to a little over 50 years ago. If we see this parameter omega empirically being anywhere near one today. If when the astronomers go out and try to measure angles with great accuracy on very large distances, and they find answers that are pretty close to Euclidean type uh, behavior, that would suggest that we're close to an omega equals one universe today. How on earth or how in the cosmos could that be true if this parameter should have been evolving to be more and more different from flat or Euclidean over time? So after 14 billion years of expansion since the Big Bang, Dickey was asking, why would we see omega anywhere near one today? That's an unstable solution to Einstein's equations rather than a point toward which things would flow. That was the nature of the, of the flatness argument. Here's an illustration that Alan Guth made some years ago for a very lovely popular book he wrote, where we can now calculate if omega is within 100% of one today, if it's anywhere really between, can basically, a, a, you know, a tenth and, and two, if we see it anywhere near that today, how close to one would omega need to have been at earlier and earlier stages? If it's been flowing away from a value over time, it would need to have been one to exponential accuracy at say one second after the Big Bang. If it's gonna be anywhere even in the ballpark, even remotely close to one observationally today. Allen chose one second for a reason. That's the time when one of the greatest successes of the Big Bang model began to start, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, a process that physicists have understood uh, really extraordinarily well. And the, and the predictions from our best descriptions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis continue to match observations very, very closely. So there are some, some uh, you know, curiosities that remain, but the picture overall is remarkably successful. And so it's, it's fair to say, we think we have a pretty good understanding of the, of the physics of the early universe at times of order one second. And so at the times when we think we can use ordinary physics to explain things, this parameter omega, would it need to have been fine tuned to exponential accuracy about one part in 10 to the 16 at that early time and then have it flow away from that value over time if we're gonna see anything even close to omega equals one today. So that became known as the flatness problem. So uh, Alan, uh, Alan actually happened to hear uh, Robert Dickey lecture on this in the late 70s. Uh, this, this really uh, lodged in, in Alan's mind. And it was uh, one of the ideas that Alan and others uh, had in mind uh, around 1980 when uh, people began thinking about cosmic inflation. The argument is that if there was a brief, even just a brief period in cosmic history during which the energy density evolved in a very different way, rather than these familiar ways, either cold pressureless matter or radiation, what if at least for a, a brief period of time, the energy density scaled in a very different way with volume or with the scale factor? And in particular, what if the energy density were at least for a brief period of time nearly constant? What if it evolved very slowly, even as the volume of space expanded? If that happened to have been the case, and we go back to our expression here, 
this numerator is just a, a constant, we would have a situation where rho more or less stays constant while the scale factor grows exponentially quickly. This number should become very large, very fast in the denominator. Therefore, this ratio should become very, very small. Omega should be driven dynamically toward one if there were a phase during which the energy density stayed nearly constant while the volume of space expanded. And so that was one kind of motivation for these early, uh, early thoughts about cosmic inflation was this flatness problem. If we have a period with a different equation of state, a period of, during which the energy density evolves in a different way as space expands, then maybe we would be driven toward a spatially flat universe. And even as it begins flowing away from that later in time, we would still expect to measure a flat universe today. And in fact, the latest value, the very pre uh, extraordinary precise value measured by the Planck collaboration uh, and released uh, just uh, about two years ago, shows that empirically omega really in our universe really does appear to be one. We really do appear to live in a spatially flat universe to better than percent level accuracy. It's extraordinary. So one of the motivations to begin thinking about an inflationary scenario was this flatness problem first articulated by Robert Dickey. So David, I have a question. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, I can understand that when uh, we assume that we start with a homogeneous isotropic universe, FLRW metric is a quite uh, like good metric to start with, but like there are, there are some certain idea called anisotropic inflation. Probably you heard about that. Yes, a little so, bit. Yeah. yeah. So there, what's the idea? They put the anisotropy in the metric or somewhere else? Yeah, so I'm not super familiar with those models, but by my understanding is the idea that one could have um, sources of matter that might drive an inflationary phase that mm -hmm. were not scalar fields, and therefore the sources of matter in our team you knew could have actually had uh, inherent anisotropies in it. But for example, uh, that sounds very abstract. If we had a universe filled with vector bosons, vectors have a preferred direction in space. So they're, therefore they're not um, isotropic. They, they have a, a directionality to them, unlike a scalar field, which has no inherent direction, only a magnitude. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea behind some of these anisotropic inflation models is to consider the, the large scale impact of sources of matter that might not already respect these symmetries of isotropy. And then ask, do you nonetheless flow toward on large scales an isotropic outcome? I think that's the motivation behind some of those models, but I might be missing something. I don't know if, you, if you're more familiar with them. Okay, and second question is like uh, here, like when you talked about inflation, their Hubble parameter is not fully constant. It's like, a little bit time varying. Otherwise, you can't able to stop it. The that's, ab that's absolutely true. That that's right. So, and we can and we can quantify that. It, it has to be um, nearly constant or vary slowly enough for for a certain duration of time, and that would and you still get this effect. So here, if you go back here, even if rho is varying slowly and not literally a constant, even if h here is not literally a constant, you could still get in a scenario where this part changes slowly and this part grows rapidly. All you want to have is a, is a phase in which the denominator grows very large, very quickly. And it could be done exactly as you say, in a, in a slowly varying state in which the Hubble parameter is not literally a constant. That's absolutely correct. Okay, That's a good thank point. you. Great, good. So this was the first of these kind of conundrums that, that uh, Robert Dickey had introduced in the late 60s. Turns out he introduced the other, another really big juicy conundrum 10 years later. So this, it's just amazing to me how much uh, Robert Dickey was, was thinking about these things much, much earlier than most of the community. So this next one became known as the horizon problem. And again, it might be familiar for you, but I think it's worth kind of talking through. This one also dates, this articulation dates to Robert Dickey. Uh, this time he published it together with his former student and, and by this point close collaborator, James Peebles, and they published this in 1979. In this famous collection that had been edited by uh, Stephen Hawking and, uh, and Werner Israel. So this became known as the horizon problem. We can map the observable universe very conveniently if we uh, work with a conformal diagram. And that is to say, we're gonna map not physical distances, but so-called co-moving distances. And so to relate a physical distance that we would measure with meter sticks or you know, kilometers or, or light years, we, we would relate that to a, a co-moving distance times this universal scaling factor, if we think about that 
homogeneous and isotropic model that we're starting from. That's where Dickey was starting from. So there's a universal scale factor that at any moment in time, we can relate a physical distance we measure with meters, meter sticks to a co-moving distance. That's we run along um, the horizontal. And we measure time with this kind of clever variable clock rate called conformal time. So instead of the cosmic time that appears in the metric that I showed before that we could think of as the time we might measure locally on our watches, we're gonna measure, you're gonna use a more convenient time-like coordinate that takes into account the varying stretching rate of space over time. And so we'll adjust those to our clock rate. That's called conformal time. And if we do that, that sounds a little confusing, but the benefit is when we map space and time in, these, in a conformal diagram, co-moving distance and conformal time, then light rays, which travel along null geodesics of our metric, they once again become very simple. So the price of, uh, or the, the, the payoff for using some maybe a little bit unfamiliar coordinates, especially in the time direction, is that then other things become much more simple and familiar again. So now we can map uh, the entire cosmic history very simply on these conformal diagrams. So again, going back to the original argument from Dickey and Peebles, if we live in a universe that started some finite time ago, if there was some big bang after which the universe began to evolve, then sometime later, after uh, certain conditions had to hold, uh, electrically neutral atoms could begin to form, hydrogen atoms could finally stably form and no longer be blasted apart by the hot remnant radiation filling the universe, uh, then that, that became known as recombination. The first moment in cosmic history when the universe had cooled sufficiently after a very hot and dense Big Bang, the universe would expand, the contents would cool, and at some calculable moment, uh, using modern values about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe would first have attained conditions at which electrically neutral stable hydrogen atoms could form. We call that recombination. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's actually just combination. They, the hydrogen hadn't been formed earlier. It's not recombination, it's just combination. Anyway, the, the older name stuck. So at that moment, that's the first time in cosmic history when photons should be free to stream macroscopic distances. Until that time, they'd be stuck in an electrically charged plasma. The optical, uh, you know, free, free, uh, mean free path would be microscopically tiny. Only once the universe is filled with electrically neutral atoms like hydrogen could photons travel macroscopic distances freely. So this is called the surface of last scattering, another term you'll, you'll often find. And it's after that moment, 380,000 years after what we would have called tau equals zero, when these photons can travel freely. We see those remnant photons today in the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB, and here's uh, an image given to us from the Planck collaboration. So here's what Dickey and Peebles began to, to wonder about in this uh, paper from 1979. We sit here, here's our world line. We receive these photons from opposite sides of the sky today and sort of everywhere in between. Those photons are remarkably uniform. The signal of the CMB is uniform as we now know to one part in about a hundred thousand, even back in, in Dickey and Peebles' day, it was known to be pretty uniform. The, the, the measurements only continue to improve. And that became a question, a conundrum, because a universe that had a, a beginning some finite time ago would only be a finite age at the time of la at the surface of last scattering, at the time when those CMB photons began their journey, ultimately reaching us much, much later. And yet we were finding remarkably uniform signals across parts of the sky that in this standard Big Bang scenario had never yet had time to coordinate with each other. That's to say the horizon distance, the, lo the longest distance even a single light ray could have traveled in the time available between the Big Bang and this emission time was not only finite, it was much, much shorter than the distance across which we presently measure such extraordinary uniformity. This became known as the horizon problem. How come parts of the sky that could never have been in causal contact, could never have exchanged even a single light beam between the Big Bang and the moment when that light was released, how could those regions of the sky have achieved such extraordinarily uniform conditions if the horizon distance at the time of emission was so much shorter than the distance across which we measure uniformity? That was what they called the horizon problem. And so again, if we think about a, a modified scenario like inflation, this was very much again on the minds of some of the early pioneers thinking about inflation back around 1980 and 81. 
He said, well, what if what we had called the Big Bang was not actually the start of time? What if there had been time we had not yet taken into account on our conformal map? If we kind of unfurl some additional time before what had been known as the Big Bang, some period we might now consider um, something like inflation, then if we trace these past light cones back further in time, the past light cones from those emission events here at the uh, surface of last scattering, then at some earlier time, those light cones will uh, overlap. And so in fact, any point, any event within the orange region will contain both of these emission, avoids, uh, emission events within its own future light cone. So in terms of the causal physics, the horizon distance could now be much, much larger than the distance over which we measure uniformity. And there could now be at least a causally self-consistent accounting for why regions of the sky that, were, that seemed to have been so far apart might indeed have had coordinated or similar conditions. So it looks like we need a fair amount of real estate. We have to add a lot of conformal time underneath what we would have called tau equals zero to accommodate these overlapping past light cones. We have to add in almost as much conformal time as between zero and us today. In fact, we have to add in, uh, it's, it's closer to the time between uh, the, the, the time of last scattering and today. So a, a large amount down here in conformal time. But remember, conformal time is a kind of funny coordinate. In terms of cosmic time, the time we might measure on our wristwatches, this is actually a blindingly brief additional period of time that's required to address this horizon problem. In, in terms of cosmic time, it would require a tiny, tiny fraction of a second of additional time here on the tau axis to accommodate the causal structure. If during that very short blip of time, the scale factor, the basic size of the average distance between any two objects had grown exponentially. So if there were a period of accelerated expansion, a brief period of accelerated expansion, during which the, cause, the scale factor grew exponentially by something like 60 e-folds, that's roughly 10 to the 27 or so. If it grew that quickly in this short blip of time, then we would, we would have at least one uh, self-consistent way to address this horizon problem. That was another uh, early motivation for these inflation models. A last uh, kind of payoff, another really important uh, idea that came from thinking about a, a, a modified early history of our universe, had to do with large scale structure. This one was not actually on the inflation theorists' minds at first. It was something they came around to recognize soon after these first models of inflation had been introduced. And again, they were returning to, in many ways, a, a, a much earlier um, challenge or open question. So then as now, astronomers have been able to observe a very robust structure in the universe across a really remarkable range of length scales. We live in structured you know, areas today. The, the worlds we move through are not uh, homogeneous and isotropic. We have dense cities and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and less dense uh, rural areas on human scales, meters and kilometers. Of course, if we look astronomically, we find robust structure across the solar system, across the galaxy, between galaxies, all the way out to hundreds of millions of, um, of, of light years and even billions of light years on the scales between the human scale and the, and the vastly extragalactic. Astronomers have found robust structure. It's not just a homogeneous mush, the way those early models would have uh, suggested, those, those entirely isotropic and homogeneous models. So we see structure across a huge range of scales. It had been recognized, again, going back to the late 60s, right around 1970, by several theorists in many parts of the world, that we could account for that range of structures uh, in relatively simply, by simple gravitational instability, if there had existed some primordial kind of seed uh, lumpiness, some seed inhomogeneities. So if one puts in by hand a certain pattern of very tiny non-uniformities across space in the energy density, so some regions have slightly more energy density than average, some regions have slightly less or under dense regions, then ordinary gravitational clumping will make the initially over dense regions accumulate more and more mass and grow more and more over dense over time the initially under dense regions become more and more evacuated and you could get robust structure across a huge range of length scales if you put in literally by hand some primordial seed in homogeneities. And in particular, again, as these uh, theorists showed in very, very beautiful analyses going back again about 50, uh, almost 50 years, that the pattern of those seeds could be really quite simple. 
They could be what we would now call a flat spectrum, where the power per wavelength is nearly equal across a huge range of scales. So the power, the, what we call the, the power spectrum, and I'll say more about that soon, could have very, very weak dependence on wave number or you know, inverse wavelength. If you put in essentially kind of cosmic white noise, a little bit of power of a, of a, um, of a, of a small scale across a huge range, a small amplitude across a huge range of scales, you could then account through this gravitational instability. The trick was you needed not only those primordial seeds, they had to exist even on very, very, very long length scales from the earliest times. Length scales that would have been outside the Hubble radius, what we think of at least naively as a kind of causal range, uh, you'd have to have these seed inhomogeneities across a huge range of length scales, even beyond our kind of um, horizon length or, or, or the, uh, the Hubble length. So this is now known as a harrison zeldovich spectrum. Uh, uh, Yakov Zeldovich began publishing on this quite early. Uh, harrison in the United States did so. It could just as well, again, have been named for, for James Peebles and his colleague, um, you. They wrote in this amazing paper in 1970, I just went back to it the other day. Uh, they were, again, like way ahead of their time on this. So here's what they conclude after showing that if you put in by hand this primordial, very simple primordial spectrum, then you can accommodate all kinds of late universe observations. But they say this, the initial perturbation that they put in by hand contains no built-in characteristic lengths. That's this scale-free or you know, very, very um, uh, weak dependence on wavelength, if any dependence at all. The perturbation to the geometry looks the same on each scale of length. So scale-free, scale invariant spectrum. They go on to say, it's well to bear in mind that in this calculation, the initial density fluctuations are invoked in an, odd hack, uh, in an ad hoc manner because we do not have a believable theory of how they might have originated. They're saying we put these in by hand and then see things would work. We don't know where they would have come from. And that was true of the other work by Zeldovich and Harrison at the time as well. And again, 10 or, or uh, 13 or so years later, a number of people who had been thinking about an inflation in the early phases of inflationary research realized that maybe this could account for this harrison zeldovich spectrum as well. So if there were a, a phase of early universe inflation during which the universe was dominant, the energy density was dominated by one or more uh, matter fields, those matter fields should be subject as all matter is to the uncertainty principle there should have been unavoidable quantum fluctuations, even in the matter that was driving this ex phase of accelerated expansion we call inflation. With a little more work, they were able to show not only would there be primordial fluctuations, but those fluctuations should give rise to a nearly scale invariant primordial spectrum. This might provide the seeds for this otherwise sort of um, uh, primordial lumpiness that the previous theorists had put in by hand. And so then a, a picture begins to emerge with several people working on this together in the early years, in the early 80s. There would be an unavoidable quantum fluctuation in the fields driving inflation. That would translate to an unavoidable uh, lumpiness, uh, 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 an unevenness or inhomogeneity in the distribution of matter and energy. That would then be reflected or impressed upon the gravitational potential. So in some regions of space, the, gravitate, the local gravitational potential would be a little more deep, a little deeper potential well than average. At the time of last scattering, when those CMB photons get released, uh, the photons that happen to be emerging from regions with deeper than average gravitational wells, regions of, of over densities, would have to expend a bit more energy to, to escape. They'd be more redshifted by the time they reached us than average. Photons that came from regions with slightly less deep gravitational wells, under dense regions, would be slightly blue shifted. That could account for the very particular patterns of uh, hot spots and cold spots uh, in the CMB today. And so the photons released at uh, that period of so-called recombination would really be mapping for us the local gravitational potential from which we could try to infer the effects of these much earlier primordial quantum fluctuations. So that was at least one way to try to account for what previously had been put in by hand that could then seed large scale structure, providing the initial conditions for this kind of harrison zeldovich spectrum. So how would we characterize all that more quantitatively? And, and uh, here there's some really quite lovely uh, textbook treat to this, I'll go a little bit quickly because it is now, uh, um, people can find this uh, in, in, in detail in a number of very lovely books. I will say when I was in graduate school, this had not yet really been, been buttoned up so tightly. 
And so uh, the notation was a mess. The, everyone had their own conventions. Now we're the beneficiaries of a lot of clarification. Uh, and now we can look at these really lovely books from recent years. How would we characterize this initial uh, lumpinesses, inhomogeneity. I'm going to go over this because it's actually helpful for the, for the next parts to come uh, for the more recent research I've been doing with, with my own colleagues. So if we were to consider a lumpy universe, then we would, that one way to capture that is to consider the space-time metric as having some perturbations around some background uh, or kind of reference metric. So this reference metric might be that very simple homogeneous and isotropic metric we started with. And then how would we consider perturbations around that? The most general set of perturbations we could write down that would reduce to the, the metric we're, we're starting with, the, that Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker metric that is maximally homogeneous and isotropic. We can characterize the perturbations this way. It looks like a mess, but there's some real pattern to it. I was hoping that color coding might help. There are a series of um, scalar functions, the, uh, the A, B, Psi, and E. Those are each scalar functions. They depend on space and time, but they have no, they only have a magnitude, no direction. There are two distinct vector perturbations, the S and the F. They also vary in space and time and they have a, a, an actual directionality to them. And then a series of tensor perturbations, little h. Now uh, to get the, the accounting to work, each of these vector perturbations must be transverse. They're divergenceless. Likewise, the, the tensor perturbations here in this schematic have to be both transverse and traceless. And if we do that, then, then we get the counting to work out. The number of physical degrees of freedom we're aiming for is 10. We're trying to characterize a, um, a four by four symmetric matrix. We can represent our, our space-time um, uh, tensor in three plus one dimensions as a symmetric four by four matrix. Symmetric four by four matrices have exactly 10 independent degrees of freedom. So we better make sure our perturbations here don't give us more degrees of freedom than those 10. And in fact, we get just the right number. We have four scalars, each of which contribute one degree of freedom. We have two vectors, but each subject to a constraint. So each of these three vectors only contributes two degrees of freedom because they have to obey this transverse uh, condition. So that's two vectors of two degrees of freedom each. And the tensors are actually constrained to be both tr uh, transverse and traceless. That gives us only two independent degrees of freedom. So we get the right number. Among all these different functions that could wiggle and vary over space and time, one of them I think is, is of real particular interest for us, and that's this one we, uh, that I might design. I have yeah. a question. Sure. So uh, here you uh, assume that the anisotropic stress is non-zero. I have, I've, uh, I've allowed for that possibility, that's right. So yeah. you know, general... is, there any, is there any motivation to do that? Thank you, it's a good question. So the motivation is we're trying to consider the broadest possible series of perturbations around a homogeneous and isotropic space-time, taking into account that the matter that could be giving, a ro giving rise to this might not respect all the symmetries that we thought. So the matter source might, be, might include anisotropies, for example, okay. uh, and, and in particular might include um, uh, anisotropic stresses. That's at least a possibility. As we deviate from a perfect fluid, there are different kinds of pressure terms that might not only be diagonal, it's called an anisotropic pressure. And if that were the case as our matter, so as our team you knew, then that would, uh, be that would show up, that would affect the space time in ways in which uh, this term need not equal that term. That would be one manifestation of a, of a anisotropic pressure. Mm -hmm. So we're, in, we're now, th now there are scenarios where that might vanish, in which case this would then just become equal to that. And I'll actually talk about scenarios like that pretty soon. But to start off with, uh, it's consistent with all the independent degrees of freedom just to do our kind of accounting work. Uh, this need not be equal to that. And that's the, that's the workaday way of saying, of answering your more sophisticated question, that what if the universe were subject to anisotropic pressures? Mm -hmm. That's a good, excellent question. And this gamma, gamma is what? Uh, gamma, is, thank you. I, uh, gamma is our background um, uh, metric on spatial sections. So this could accommodate an overall curvature. That, that's the gamma I went by. Let me go quickly back here just to get it back on our screen. It's this gamma here. So oh, this is what okay, 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 okay. Yeah. So, so it's this that could, that could accommodate both an overall stretching and some non-trivial uh, ah, okay. global, global curvature. Yes. I'm going to call that little gamma. Good, 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 good. So we've gotten, we've done our accounting right. The next thing to think about is one of, of all these little things that could wiggle all through space and time, this, this 
particular scalar, scalar function psi is of real interest. If we calculate the Ricci scalar on spatial sections, so the, the Ricci scalar on, these, on the, in, on the hyper, spatial hypersurfaces, it's actually proportional just to psi. Of all the things that are wiggling here, the, the scalar curvature, the scalar curvature on spatial sections is proportional to psi. So we can think of psi really as the kind of curvature perturbation, uh, or this is capturing that kind of information for us. So we want to, what are ways to zero in on that, on that particular perturbation psi? Moreover, if we're only working to first order in these tiny perturbations, sorry, if we're only working to first order, then what, these different kinds of perturbations decouple from each other. That's to say the evolution of each of these scalars, A, B, Psi, and E, is independent of the evolution of either the vectors or the tensors and vice versa. So dynamically, these different kinds of perturbations decouple at linear order if we only expand to first order in perturbations. So we want, so we're curious about this psi, and if we only care about first order perturbations, the evolution of psi, the dynamics of psi, will not depend on either the vectors or the tensors and vice versa. So we've gotten the right number of degrees of freedom. We've accounted for all kinds of scenarios and, and, not, uh, and, we, and we have the right number of functions to, to track, but we still have a redundancy. And again, this might be quite familiar, but it's- Probably David, uh, one more. Uh, yeah. like. I think this shouldn't be gamma, this should be delta ij, because you have taken a square outside. Um, but it, right, but if there were a spatial curvature, it wouldn't just be a delta. If there were a global curvature, uh, if we're expanding, you know, I could be perturbing around a spatially open universe, and that would be captured in the gamma here. Now, but what, when you have introduced in the first, uh, uh, in the previous slides, there yeah. you have taken gamma ij dx i dx j. I'm sorry, say the last part again? No, I'm saying that uh, in the previous slide, when you have introduced this gamma metric, yeah. the, the scale factor is not outside. Oh, that's a typo, thank you. That's entirely my fault, that's a typo. You're absolutely right. I, sh I, I meant to write the a squared in front. Okay, that's the confusion, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. That's right. That's just my typo, and I, I'll, I'll fix the slide. So there's, there's, I can pull out an overall time varying uh, scale factor, and I should have written that here. You're, you're, that's right. That's so just the, my. The, the confusion was I feel like gamma is space time dependent both. It could be, and it just depends on what we do. It, we just have to get our de definition straight. So you're right. I was working too quickly here. We could just as well consider gamma to be the induced metric on co moving spatial surfaces. That's yeah. what I had in mind for this later part. That's right. Thank you for that clarification. That's important. That's right. Uh, and so, you, yeah, we could, I, I'm running out of Greek letters, but I could have called this something that scaled the, the, the A squared down. But you're, you, thank you for catching it. I, I'd missed that. The idea is that this is, I, what I wanted to do is keep open the possibility of global curvature and consider perturbations around that. So the background around which we're expanding could still be spatially homogeneous and isotropic and yet have that global curvature. How would we consider perturbations in that, in that scenario? And I just goofed by leaving my A squared off the earlier slide. That's a good, good catch. Thank you for that. Any other questions on that? Okay. So we've gotten the correct number of degrees of freedom and yet we still have a gauge redundancy. So I could have laid out this set of coordinates and tried to characterize a kind of lumpiness at various locations across space and how they change over time. My friend might have laid out slightly different coordinates. And therefore what I had characterized as um, the position X with some perturbation, she might have characterized as actually the position X prime with no perturbation. So under a coordinate transformation, what we call these perturbations will be shuffled around a little bit. If I try to compare notes with my friend who used slightly different coordinates, that's a gauge redundancy under coordinate transformations. And actually it was first shown by uh, James Bardeen in 1980, it's really quite remarkable, that a certain combination of these factors will nonetheless remain invariant even under these coordinate transformations up to first order. So invariant up to order whatever this sort of uh, small coordinate shift might be that we can call C. So to first order in this coordinate transformation, this combination will remain unchanged. Therefore, we can form gauge and variant combinations that are invariant up to first order, first order in perturbations, first order in coordinate transformations. They're not gauge and variant to arbitrary order, but if we're only working to linear order, we can construct these combinations, very clever combinations that we now call the Bardeen potentials. Then we can choose to work in any number of gauges and compare notes and be confident that we'll be able to find agreement even if my friend had laid out slightly different coordinates to start with. 
So one particularly convenient choice that's used uh, often in the literature on early universe cosmology is called longitudinal gauge, or sometimes you'll see it called Newtonian gauge. We can work entirely to linear order in terms of these very convenient gauge invariant Bardeen potentials. And because to linear order, the scalar modes decouple from vectors and tensors, if we only want to track, say, the scalar degrees of freedom, then we can characterize this very uh, large mess in a much simpler form by choosing a gauge and working in terms of the gauge invariant parameters. And again, coming back to the earlier question, in general, these two scalar functions need not coincide at perturbative order. There could be these anisotropic pressures that would, in general, would source a difference between phi and psi. They could evolve differently. In other scenarios, they ha could happen to evolve the same, and they might be um, equivalent. But in general, they need not coincide. Okay. So that's characterizing this, how we characterize the space-time. What about the matter contents in such a universe? So now let's consider a model where we have a lot of moving parts, many degrees of freedom. Uh, and we'll see that's gonna be of interest uh, for many kind of realistic models of, of high energy physics. So now I'll consider a model that includes different kinds of scalar fields. I'll restrict my, ten my attention to scalar fields, but they can be many of them and they can interact in all kinds of ways. So here's the action. I'm gonna assume for now canonical Einstein-Hilbert gravity uh, we could relax that, but I'll start with canonical gravity. But then there could be non-canonical kinetic terms. There could be a field space metric, a field space manifold and different kind of derivative couplings between the scalar fields, as well as a, a direct coupling in the interaction potential. So just to consider general possibilities among many interacting scalar fields. We could characterize the action that way. Then if we vary the action in the usual way with respect to the space-time metric, we arrive at the energy, energy momentum tensor. It has that form. Now again, as we were just considering perturbations, space and time dependent perturbations of the metric, we can consider perturbations in the matter fields and how they vary across space and time. So we could consider first order perturbations around some spatially homogeneous background values, uh, much as we were doing for the metric. Then we can expand Einstein's field equations to first order. Now we again want to work to, with, with gauge invariant quantities that will be gauge invariant to first order in any of these perturbations. This field fluctuation here, much like those scalar functions on the previous slide, it's gauge dependent. If I laid out different coordinates than my neighbor, we'll disagree on what we label as the field fluctuations because we disagree on our labeling of points in space and time. Nonetheless, again, it's quite remarkable to me, both um, uh, Mukhanov and Sasaki around the same time independently realized we could form gauge invariant quantities that kind of reduce to the field uh, fluctuations, but that take into account the possibility of this kind of um, relabeling of points in space and time. So we call these now the mukhanov sasaki variables. These are gauge invariant, again, two linear order, the first order in wiggles and lumpiness across space and time. These quantities, the Q, uh, we'll all agree on to first order. Or we can, very, we can focus on related quantities that, that reduce to that curvature perturbation. Remember, psi is gauge dependent. It's related to this quantity of interest to us, the spatial, sp scalar spatial curvature. But psi alone does depend on gauge. We can form other uh, gauge invariant combinations. They're not the same as the Bardeen potentials. Now they depend on the matter content. So we take this, basically quantities related to this gauge dependent field fluctuation and this gauge dependent metric perturbation, and we can form various gauge and variant combinations of those that were reduced to the quantity of interest in appropriate gauges. So this is, uh, these are often called zeta or capital R. What still boggles my mind, I find this absolutely astonishing, is that if we just solve the uh, perturbed Einstein field equations to leading or to linear order, we accommodate all the different ways the space-time metric could vary. We accommodate these kinds of fluctuations among even very complicated matter fields. The evolution, the dynamics for this gauge invariant curvature perturbation become unbelievably simple. It's still amazing to me we can do this. It obeys a, 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 a very simple equation of motion. There could in general be some source term that would come from multiple degrees of freedom. We have many, if we have many interacting scalar fields, but even in the case of many scalar fields, this source term can still generically vanish or it can be non-zero only in, in special circumstances. So in many cases of interest, even in multi-field models, we're considering cases in which the source term is vanishing. Then we can ask about how these uh, gauge invariant curvature perturbations should behave on very long length scales. 
let's consider wavelengths much longer than the Hubble radius. That means wave number is very small, much smaller than the inverse uh, Hubble radius. In that case, we'll find that a solution will always be that these are just constant in time. After these modes uh, oscillate rapidly inside the Hubble radius with some characteristic dynamics, they'll be redshifted uh, as the universe expands, their, their wavelengths will. And when their wavelength stretches beyond the Hubble radius, they will stop evolving and they'll get frozen in quite generically, even in many otherwise complicated multi-field scenarios. There's a lovely review article on this, by the way, by, uh, by Gong from just a few years ago. Some, this is work that some of my um, students and I worked out some years before that. So then we I, can I count- I have a question in the, in sure. the slide. So yep. the question is like, uh, so you talked about many fields. Now, the question is, and the fields are tagged with the index i and j's through which you, you can actually differentiate. Now the yes. question is, if these fields are not talking to each other, mm -hmm. but just talking it to itself. So in that case, you are talking about the source time is zero? Uh, yes, in general, that would be the case. The source term will be not so zero. Why am I this particular scenario is called the inflation or something like that? That's right. That's one scenario. But, it, it, but this, the case in which the source term will vanish is actually much more general than just the so-called inflation. In fact, you can have very highly complicated interactions among the scalar fields. They could be directly coupled here. They could scatter off each other in the interaction potential. They could have all these non-canonical kinetic terms that could couple one to the other. So even in those much more general scenarios, the source term will only be non-vanishing. S will only be non-zero what I've called S here, if the trajectory of those fields, of those background fields, uh, is non-geodesic, if there's a period where there's a kind of acceleration in field space, a turning in field space, uh, and there are many kinds of multi-field models, many kinds that I've worked on in particular, and others have too, in which case, even though there are um, um, complicated dynamics among the different fields, the system will relax into what we call a single field attractor, and they'll follow a single, a sort of constant trajectory through field space with no turning. There will be an early transient, but then they'll settle into a kind of local minimum of the potential is one scenario where this happens. And then they will evolve without turning. The, this source term here, it, the coefficient, sorry, is given by that, what's called the turn rate. So if there's no turning in field space, if these things evolve basically geodesically uh, in the field space, then even with many fields that actually couple to each other, interact, you'd still have a vanishing source term for the perturbation. So in fact, like you, and that's the sort of thing that we talk about in this paper, and, and, and many people have noted that, uh, okay. and Gong's review does that quite nicely. So there are many scenarios beyond only the kind of simple case of that inflation, where the source term becomes negligible, uh, even in multi-field models. I find that, real, again, really pretty astonishing. It's pretty cool. Good, good question. So, so now that the evolution of these gauge invariant curvature perturbations can be relatively simple, we can then ask about the statistics of these things. We can calculate things like the two-point function. What's the, uh, what, how, do these, how do the perturbations vary at different points in the sky? And a particularly convenient way to characterize that is the dimensionless power spectrum. It's given here. That's really saying, what's the power per, per, per logarithmic interval k uh, as we look at different points in the sky? Now, again, for many, many families of, mo of inflationary models, we can calculate the dynamics uh, of these perturbations R. I just showed you uh, what the, the wave equation is actually pretty simple for, for individual modes R. And therefore, we can calculate the power, the dimensionless power spectrum pretty, pretty straightforwardly. And for a wide class of models, the answer takes this sort of form. It's basically a power law in wave number K with some amplitude that's set by the scale of both uh, the Hubble radius and how quickly the Hubble radius was changing at the time that modes first crossed outside the Hubble radius. So there's an amplitude that's fixed by the, the time during inflation when those modes crossed outside the Hubble radius, and then a, a, a possible, um, the possibility of a kind of spectral tilt. And then the, uh, the amplitude that we measure on the sky of the anisotropies is basically given by, is, is directly related to the power, the average power. And we can see from these, the fact that these wiggles are very tiny on the sky, one part in 100,000, 
but the average power in these modes it really is perturbatively small. This is a nice self-consistency check that working only the linear order in these perturbations is a reasonable thing to do if we want to characterize things like the primordial spectrum. This really does appear to be well-controlled linear physics, linear order in these spatially varying perturbations. And then that feeds into that those are the, in, the initial uh, seeds for that um, primordial spectrum. And then you can evolve that through all the gloriously juicy physics at the time of recombination, um, Thomson scattering of electrons, uh, of photons off electrons, a baryon acoustic uh, plasma of the baryons kind of being, being um, hammered by some coherent large scale perturbation and ringing. Uh, and that's what gives rise to all the complicated peaks and valleys of these now very famous plots. It's the ingoing nearly flat nearly scale invariant kind of initial hammer, the initial strike of those coherent, very long scale perturbations that sets in motion all the bumps and wiggles, uh, or that would be consistent, I should say, with all the bumps and wiggles of these impeccably measured now uh, peaks of the CMB spectrum, from which then the Planck collaboration can infer best fit values for this primordial spectrum. We really do seem to live in a universe with vanishing uh, spatial curvature, this, what this is called the spectral index, the tilt of this, uh, the power uh, per wavelength really seems to be very close to flat, but not identically flat. In fact, it's about eight sigma away from being exactly flat. We can now measure that, the Planck team and other teams can measure that spectral index remarkably well. The it, perturbations are nearly adiabatic. They are nearly Gaussian. We can talk about those details. And again, this is handled, uh, treated in, in, in lovely detail by some very nice modern monographs. But the point is, Pretty simple linear physics enables us to account for this amazing amount of real uh, recent data uh, because the primordial power spectrum is usefully characterized quantitatively at linear order. So that was the kind of triumph of the familiar, uh, of what's uh, familiar to many folks. So, uh, I have two questions in the previous slides. Sure, yeah. So uh, since uh, you have now the handle with the Mukhanov-Sasaki equation, so you can actually know that either numerically or maybe analytically the exact form of the uh, curvature perturbation RK. Okay, so since you know RK, you can directly calculate the power spectrum. Okay, now my question is then why you are uh, assuming a power law form? Uh, like, because taking the derivative of the spectrum, you can actually calculate the tilt but uh, once I say in this power law form, uh, isn't it we are losing a little bit of information there? Because... Oh, oh go ahead, yeah. Uh, and also the thing is, during this uh, 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 like parameterization, uh, it might happen that your spectral tilt is also scale dependent, a little yeah. bit. Yes, that's right. That's right. So thank you. Excellent question to clarify. So uh, this is the leading order result. I should say there could be um, uh, kind of derivatives of, uh, uh, there could be K dependence of the spectral index and you can calculate what that would be expected to be and so on. So I didn't put in the power law by hand. This is the leading order result from calculating the, the evolution of quantized perturbations in this gauge invariant way to linear order and perturbations. And so what, again, what, what, what I find astonishing is that we solve this equation uh, for particular models that we have ideas about the dynamics here and the way that these fields evolve and so on. Model by model, we can calculate the, uh, the theoretical prediction for this power spectrum. And this is indeed the leading order. We can look at subdominant terms. The subdominant terms in many models will be consistent with zero, what's called zero running with a, a, a scale invariant spectral index. So it really is the, this, this term is really, um, uh, is, 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 is the kind of um, uh, quantitatively dominant term. Likewise for here, the actual value for H and epsilon at a Hubble crossing could vary by the dynamics of the model. Those are things that one can calculate sort of model by model. But uh, but across huge ranges of these models, the, 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 the spectra will relax to this form to leading order, and you can then calculate uh, corrections to next to leading order and so on within this controlled uh, expansion. So, so that's a good point. I was just trying to say the, the dominant contribution uh, from our ingoing first principles model will, will generically take this form. 
And then you can check to see, you can constrain model parameters. If a model, if a particular model predicted too strong a running of the, of the index, then that would be in tension with this data, for example. So what, what's wrong with that model that it can't match the data and so on. So you can actually turn it around and use this extraordinary fit and the constraints on it. I didn't put down the constraints on the running, though it's consistent with zero. Then you can say, well, if your model predicts too strong a running, that you know, too bad for your models and so on. So, so you, can, you can have a real dialogue with really robust high precision data and this kind of first principles modeling. So really can, it's a conversation back and forth, which I find again, kind of astonishing. Yeah, I want to point one more thing here. Sure. So as you see that for the large uh, values of the L, the error bar is very, very small. Okay, now the problem is if you try to fit your model, you may get a lot of models are uh, uh, coming within this fit. Now it may happen that your this uh, uh, running may distinguish between different types of models. Yes, yeah. oh, in, gen in general it could. The trouble is the empirically the running is so tightly constrained that it's very hard to tweak, tweak the running and have all the other points um, stay reasonably compliant, right? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's very, so, so that's it. And, and what, again, it, it, what you're pointing to is, a, is a, I think, a really exciting development that we've all reached in the field. When I was in graduate school in the 90s, we couldn't do any of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you know, when, when I was, I, I had a picture, let me show very quickly. It's a great point. I, let me just take a moment to linger on this. We have three generations of satellite-based measurements of the CMB, let alone many, many very cool ground-based measurements. I was a, a senior in college. I was an undergraduate when the COBE results were released. And they could measure that there were perturbations and they could barely measure anything beyond that. And that's not a knock on them. This was you know, 1980s, 1990s technology. Yes. 10 years later, WMAP uh, released its first, uh, first data. And there was an improvement of, by a factor of about 30 in the angular resolution in the sky. They could now measure really the perturbation spectrum, even on very short uh, angular scales. That's a large multipoles, large L you were just pointing to. 10 years later, the Planck team released their results with about another improvement of roughly a factor of 30 in angular resolution. I was starting grad school and we had this to work with, right? Like take off your glasses and squint. That's the resolution we had. If you have as bad eyesight as I can. Yes. By the time, you know, WMAP released its first data in 2003, it's like, oh, there's really data there, right? There's really a pattern. You can do real statistics on those lumps and wiggles. And, you, and if, if your model says you're way out of compliance at small scales, now we know what the pattern is of those small scales. And then 10 years after that, by two, starting in 2013, most recent data released 2018 with the Planck satellite, you know, there's literally not much wiggle room left. You think about these wiggles at the, at the small angular scales, the high multipoles, this is extraordinarily constraining. So I started this business with like, oh, you better get the first peak, <laughs> you know, yeah. squint, get the first peak. Now you have like seven subsidiary peaks. So that makes it, I think, um, fantastic. I think that's unbelievable that we are so kind of rigidly constrained by these kinds of data sets now. And of course, it's more than just the CMB, though this provides a remarkable amount of information. So you can play the games of saying, let me put in a model that has um, a little more running, of, say, of the spectral index. That might match something here, but is just as likely to throw you out of compliance here or vice versa. So that's where we get really, um, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a real bite. There's real empirical constraint in a way that, that is is relatively recent in our field, and I think very exciting. Well, uh, and what's also one, exciting is that one whole, question whole, here oh, you have that, uh, like I know that, like you know that there are lots of inflationary model exist. Okay, now if you do the data analysis and try to fit and all, maybe you will find out that thousands of models are fitting. Now the my question is like, what we can do, like how you can yeah. say that. Uh, which one is good or which one is bad like that 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 point is a little bit like because we don't have any handle with the tensor modes that's right well we have a handle we know that if certain models predict too much then those are in trouble yeah so we have, i'm not we have talking about tensor. those things yeah but like yeah. No, you, it's a great point again that's that's so there are families of models that give very similar sets of predictions yeah. and at the, at the present moment it's difficult to see how to distinguish among them empirically and there are ways, but they get pretty subtle. And other models that are really clearly in tension with the data. So that's an enormous, pro if you look at where we've come from, that's a lot of progress, but we're not done. 
So this general form is not that every single model fits that form, but many of them will, will kind of relax to that kind of attractor form, which itself I find very interesting. And then there are things like, well, maybe there's a tiny fraction of what's called isocurvature modes that are maybe that are consistent with the data, though not directly detected. Different models predict different amounts of that. Are you within constraints? And if so, could next generation measurements to tell them apart? Likewise with something called non-Gaussianity. So there are other ways just within the CMB to further try to dis disambiguate predicted uh, signals from different kinds of models. And it's something I've worked on quite a bit with my own group uh, and many, of course, many people around the world work on that. So partly it's saying with next generation measurements that can drill down on some of these parameters, not just tensor scalar, which is very important, but also some of these other uh, characteristics, even of the, um, of the TT spectrum itself and the other cross correlations, are there things that are at the moment in this, you know, consistent with zero with the error bars of the data, but that 10 years from now might actually be clearly measurable in the way that these peaks never used to be measurable but now they are. So that's part of the, the, the kind of next phase to say, are there, what other features of, are predicted by this kind of model, this family model, this specific model in this parameter range? Might there be further ways, just as we've done with the CMB to date, to, to distinguish among those. And I think that's really important. And, and I think we have the feasibility to do it now, partly because so much of this still is within, within a linearized regime. We have, we have robust theoretical tools with which to address those questions. And I think that again is something to celebrate. That's really great. Uh, and so we have the work to do. Very uh, impressive next generation experiments, not just including CMB, some other uh, sort of three dimensional large scale structure surveys that could be helpful as well. Constraints on the matter power spectrum as well as CMB. So there's, you know, there's lots of work still to do is I think that's an optimistic answer. We're not done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but yeah, I can understand, but like, <laughs> I just want to point this. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're right. And again, it's, it's sort of like the, the glass is, I don't know if it's half full or half empty. No, a lot of people, lot of people ask me that. So you guys deal with a lot of models. Which one is better? Can you be able to tell me? <laughs> right, right, right. And, and so, I, you know, that's what I tend to think of inflation as a framework. And then there are models that could have realized a phase. Inflation means, was there a period during which the scale factor accelerated in its, its expansion? That's a very general statement. Then we can ask, is there one or other physical instantiations that could that would give rise to that? If so, what else would you hope to see in, on the sky? And can we better characterize it? But inflation is a kind of, me as I think about it, is a mechanism, a hypothetical mechanism. We don't know that it happened, but it would be consistent with many things that otherwise seem to line up. So um, was there a period of accelerated expansion? Maybe, maybe not. If so, what were the mechanisms, the, the particular models and, and parameter ranges that could have given rise to that? And then could we uh, uh, further constrain or, or those or rule out some possibilities and so on? So that's how I tend to think about this, this that question. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great, great questions. Thank you. So this is uh, now just in a nutshell, where, where have we gotten to? We now have over 30 plus years uh, of, or uh, 30 years of really uh, a careful research we can now write these kind of cartoons. We can boil it down and say there are many, many kinds of observations are at least consistent with the following hypothesis. That it's for a brief period in early cosmic history, there was a phase in which the energy density varied slowly. The Hubble radius changed slowly compared to its, uh, its kind of average value. That's consistent with this kind of quasi deciderate or accelerated expansion. Fluctuations during that period are unavoidable. Quantum fluctuations of any matter field should exist. We can study in great detail how they would get amplified and stretched. And we can do all that in a gauge invariant way to linear order. That's a great, we should celebrate that. That's a great triumph. But now we have all these other questions. We have lots of other questions. What might have happened before this period of inflation? Could we characterize that? And what would happen after the end of inflation? So let me talk next. And maybe this is what all I'll get to. I'll spend a while on this, on this next part about uh, the onset of inflation. How might we try to characterize that quantitatively? And that, as I will shift to next, forces us to go beyond linear order. Likewise, trying to understand the end of inflation during this period called reheating. So there's all this really juicy, really hard, but really cool, interesting nonlinear physics that would kind of bookend this otherwise very, uh, I think, very lovely linearized analysis that we can now do um, for the period during inflation itself. So let me turn to what uh, some students and colleagues and I have been looking at for the, uh, try to understand the onset of inflation with some, uh, with what we hope to be some generality. 
So one question is that's been long asked in this in the literature is does inflation itself require fine-tuned initial conditions? It was po inflation was put together to try to address certain kind of fine-tuning questions, flatness and um, horizon and origins of structure. But does inflation itself require some kind of special conditions? And in particular, the way this question then was kind of refined throughout the 1980s in particular, was does inflation require an initial patch of space time to be more or less free of these lumps? Do you need a, a kind of unusually or unnaturally smooth patch across some long distance, some distance of order of the Hubble radius in order for inflation to start. And I have to say, my colleague, uh, my mentor, Robert Brandenburg, who was on my dissertation committee uh, many years ago, Robert was among the first to really take this question seriously and try to answer it very carefully and quantitatively. Uh, and so th there was, this is an example from one of his early, his own early numerical papers from the 80s. So the earliest efforts were to study one plus one dimensional uh, numerical relativity. Remember, in the 1980s, that's what kind of computers could handle. This was, again, not their failure of imagination, but the tools available were really quite different compared to today. So Robert and, and others uh, started asking this question, could you simulate the onset or, or the non-onset of inflation among uh, initial conditions where you have these space-time um, inhomogeneities that could be, um, could it interrupt the flow into inflation? And frankly, the results were ambiguous. Some analyses said, yes, inflation could actually be, could fail to start. Others said, no, it'll start anyway. And that really came down as much to computing systematics as much as anything else. There's a really a valuable review article that summarizes a lot of that 1980s work. The review article itself came out. So you know that Robert wrote a, a really nice brief review article on this much more recently, and then even more recently is a very nice re uh, review of, of some of this uh, from uh, my friends and colleagues just from uh, last year. Okay, so much more recently, two groups independently have returned to this question, but now with, with really modern tools. And this is, I think, again, very exciting, very sophisticated work. One group led by uh, William East, the other group led by Katie Clough. Katie's group's been especially active in this, continuing to study it. They've now used the modern techniques with real fancy, you know, present day computers and all that people have learned about numerical relativity coding over the last 30 years. And now they're pursuing three plus one dimensional numerical relativity simulations of this question of the onset of inflation amid initial inhomogeneities. Here's an example I take from one of Katie uh, and collaborators' papers. This, they can calculate what's called the extrinsic curvature uh, under what they consider fairly general initial conditions. Both of these groups are finding results that are broadly consistent with each other. And again, the cartoon version to summarize these very sophisticated studies is a so-called large field inflation models. We have some field starting displaced from some minimum. It could be up sort of the side of some uh, um, kind of uh, polynomial kind of bowl. But these models of which there are many, many varieties, they tend to be robust to inflation starting even amid very large initial inhomogeneities where the local over densities could be several hundred times the average density, really dramatic lumpiness. Meanwhile, so-called small field inflation, plateau-like models and others, they require more specialized initial conditions. There are more cases in which the universe will not start to inflate in, under these scenarios than these. However, even in, the, even in those cases, inflation is more likely to start than the kind of analytic estimates had suggested. There can be nonlinear processes that actually make inflation more likely in regions of parameter space one might have otherwise concluded wouldn't happen. That's just summarizing very briefly their really quite sophisticated work. However, these simulations to date, even these very beautiful recent ones, have been limited by, uh, and still really by computing power. These simulations are amazing, but they're hard. <laughs> they're expensive computationally. And so you really, so far, have not been able to do kind of ex study many kinds of models or broad regions of phase space of initial configurations or broad regions of parameter space, because any given run is already really, really hard for these computers. So what I was working on with my uh, colleagues and students was a, a, the goal of trying to develop a complementary approach, not trying to capture the fully nonlinear structure of the full Einstein field equations the way these beautiful simulations by the other groups can do, but can we capture some of the, what, what might be most relevant nonlinear physics, relevant as gauged by the, the other group's studies, but find a kind of a numerically much more efficient way to focus on subsets of nonlinear physics, certain kinds of interactions, that would nonetheless let us do these kind of broader sweeps across phase space 
and parameter space. And to the extent that our more recent simulations overlap, they should be comparable to situations that were uh, uh, simulated by the, by the full group, by the, I'll call the serious groups. Can we compare? Are, they, are the two approaches consistent? We see that so far they actually really do broadly agree. So let me talk about the approach that we've been taking. You can see the reference here. Uh, can I can I interrupt you for a second before? Of course, yeah. So uh, uh, the previous slide. Can we go to the previous slide? Yep. Yes. So I think I think in in for the case of small field inflation, uh, uh, at least that that uh, I heard in one of the talks by Katie Glock. Mm -hmm. uh, the by small field they're only considering uh, hilltops, as I of now, I as of now, it. and mm -hmm. that's why the results are not as great. Uh, like, like the generality of initial condition is not as great as possible. If you take a usual plateau, which continues for a long time, yes, I think you will you will still get a pretty good uh, gen generic initial condition leading to inflation. Th th thank you. That's a great, great comment, and and I and I agree. And in particular, I think that only makes more clear the, the other point I was making. It's consistent with what I was saying that these simulations are really computationally expensive. They're cool. I mean, they're amazing. Uh, but they're really hard. You can't do you know, an, an unlimited number of them. And so they've been studying you know, particular models in limited ranges of parameter space and phase space. And that's consistent with exactly what you're saying. They haven't yet been able to do the kind of you know, broad characterization that we can do with, with linearized physics. Just as we, as we were saying a moment ago, we can compare a gajillion inflationary models with the CMB, or half a gajillion. We compare lots of them, right? But it's much harder when we have to get into the real nitty gritty of nonlinear physics. We're limited so far in the types of models and even the parameter space of a given model uh, to give this kind of, of really detailed treatment to. And I think that's exactly what you're pointing out. I agree with yes. you. I think this is thank you. No, thank you. It's an excellent point. And that's probably what we're aiming for here. Now, I, I don't want to oversell. So far, we've only also been able to do one simple model, but we're trying to build a, a machinery to try to get to, to address the questions that you raised uh, more systematically. So I have a kind of intermediate um, uh, a status report. We're, we're still working on it. But with that, with that goal in mind, could we try to expand the kinds of models, large field, small field, multi-field, which are trickier, and so on? So that's what we're trying to build up toward, exactly for that, for that kind of reason. So let me talk about how we've been approaching the question of nonlinear structure. That's, I think, actually also pretty fun. It's pretty cool. And then we'll talk about the simulations we've done so far with, again, a very simple model just to start and also to help us calibrate with some of these fuller numerical relativity simulations. Then I'll tell you the, the kinds of things we've been finding that even with our sort of simplified approach so far enables us to try to ask what we think of as more systematic questions, even for a single model, uh, a single simple model, we can now ask about a kind of phase space uh, as opposed to one or two kind of initial configurations. So again, starting with, with, with Katie's work and her group, in their full three plus one numerical relativity simulations, they often do find that black holes will form if you have a really, really intense initial overdensity, very localized, but very high amplitude, then generically those can indeed form collapse into black holes as we would expect them to. And their, and their software can catch that, mine can't catch that. Uh, where, as, for reasons I'll say in a moment. So on the other hand, what they find, and, there's, and, and uh, there's some interesting analytic arguments that are consistent with that, that even when these pre-inflationary extreme inhomogeneities do collapse into black holes, none of those black holes grow as large as the Hubble radius, and the space outside of those regions continue to expand. The extrinsic curvature is still consistent with an expanding universe. So in a sense, the density of these very, very pre-inflationary, very early, black holes, if they were to form, the density gets, gets um, diluted. And even in, in these full simulations, that does not interrupt the overall flow of some larger region of space time, some Hubble region flowing towards inflation. So that gave us license, frankly. Uh, we took that as a sign to, to say our, our code would never catch um, those extraordinary nonlinear physics of black holes. And maybe we don't have to, because they form, they got diluted, and, they, and in the full simulations, they don't seem to disrupt. The, the flow of, the, of a Hubble patch to, into an inflationary behavior. So that was one, one example that gave us kind of license. There's another thing that comes up, coming back to this question of gauge subtleties. I mentioned earlier in that uh, first part that if we only work to linear order and perturbations, we have this really very beautiful uh, gauge invariant formalism. It's only gauge invariant to first order, right? That's a lot, but that's not, you know, it doesn't help us for, for strongly nonlinear physics. 
If we were to continue perturbing, uh, uh, think about a perturbative expansion of, say, the Einstein field equations beyond first order in those metric perturbations, then we get, uh, the, the, then we lose that really nice feature of the scalar modes and the vectors and tensors decoupling. As early as second order and arbitrary order beyond that, all these different kinds of perturbations now are dynamically coupled together by the Einstein field equations. So there's no way to study only the scalar dynamics separated from the vectors and especially important, the tensors and vice versa. So there's no straightforward generalization of these popular gauges like longitudinal or synchronous or anything else beyond linear order that would only work, uh, feature the scalar degrees of freedom. And I just, as a footnote here, therefore, there's a lot of, of papers on the archive, dozens and literally maybe even hundreds by now of, of papers on what's often called gravitational back reaction, trying to go to second order in these scalar metric perturbations. But the, the, the huge majority of those papers ignore tensor modes. And, and therefore, I think they're just, uh, they're, I think they're inconsistent. At second order and above, the evolution of these things that people are studying uh, are, are gonna be affected by these things and vice versa. So, so that's a, a challenge to just trying to go perturbatively kind of a next order in, in these gravitational degrees of freedom. On the other hand, again, we get a cover. We have insights from other groups that do the full numerical relativity. This now comes from my friend Tom Giblin and, and his, one of his recent papers with colleagues. Uh, he, Tom's also an expert in numerical relativity, much like Katie and William East and the others. Uh, so in his studies of late universe dynamics, they were comparing different linearized treatments of perturbations to their full numerical relativity. And they actually find that the linearized longitudinal gauge, the gauge that I had highlighted before, does best in comparison with the numerical relativity. It's both numerically stable, it's also act more accurate, and even uh, the, the divergences, the departures from the fully nonlinear results, scale in the way you'd expect. The divergences do scale as like second order in the thing you're, you're calculating, whereas divergences for say synchronous gauge are wildly larger than only um, second order in what seemed to be a small quantity. So the, the lo linearized longitudinal gauge has a lot going for it when we would try to compare with the fully nonlinear field equations. In fact, they found that on very long length scales outside the Hubble radius, the linearized dynamics in longitudinal gauge actually exaggerate the gravitational effects. You get, you get a more extreme gravitational response if you look only at linearized order compared to some sort of compensating nonlinear effects of the full Einstein field equations. So in some sense, you're sort of, um, it seemed to us that we had a kind of uh, extra reason to, to push this longitudinal gauge in linearized perturbation theory on the gravitational side as far as we could compared to other popular gauges. So our goal was to work to first order in the metric perturbations, only scalar perturbations, uh, and to work in the spatially varying uh, Bardeen potential or the, the so-called Newtonian potential. So that's on the gravitational side, but now we still wanna consider nonlinear interactions among the matter. So we're gonna consider a, a, a simple single field model. It has canonical gravity, canonical kinetic terms, and some potential just to start, just to get us going. That's the thing where we think we now have a means to generalize that down the road. Let's consider that single field being subject to the uncertainty principle, to a quantum state of matter. So we can consider it to be a quantum operator. It has some, in general, non-vanishing vacuum expectation value, which is gonna be spatially homogeneous. It will have some spatially varying fluctuations whose expectation value will vanish. And we can expand the fluctuations in the way we ordinarily would. And we can start again by, by, by assuming that the background space-time around which we're expanding could in, in general have some non-trivial curvature. So it could have first, first order fluctuations in space and could be, uh, have a global curvature as well. So we want to keep that option open. Now let's incorporate non-linearities among the matter interactions. So let's go to arbitrary order n in the delta phi. And now how could we do that while well, be consistent with what I just mentioned before about our perturbed line element? And this is actually, again, I think it's pretty neat. So we're gonna to work to be consistent with the, with the Einstein field equations. We can only keep terms on the matter side in T mu nu that are linear in spatially varying quantities to be consistent to only keeping this, this single scalar degree of freedom or maybe two of them phi inside. But only, we're only working the first order on the, on the perturbed G mu nu side. So whatever we do with the T mu nu side can only vary the first order in, across space. And it turns out that's, that still buys us a lot of interesting terrain. Inflationary models to be able to match the, the pristine CMB and all that 
are typically weakly coupled. The kind of coupling constants that, the, the, that we want encounters in any kind of model are typically pretty weak, pretty small. And that's consistent with uh, the S matrix for these processes of these, these um, the evolution of these coupled quantum fields should be strongly dominated by forward scattering processes. That's a, that's a lot of words. It's like, it's really just like Rutherford scattering. If the cross section for the, uh, for the kind of quantum fields interacting with each other, if the cross section is small and the cross section in general will scale with these coupling constants, then you expect most of the time you're gonna have small angle deflections you're going to, a, a very large transverse momentum event should be very rare. That's, that's how Rutherford found the nucleus, right? Now, not only from cartoons, we can actually grind through the, the quantum field theory more carefully. The idea is that high transverse, transverse momentum events should be quite rare as we think about all the events within the S matrix for weakly coupled systems. What, what you should find most often are forward scattering processes. That's a very, a, a very general statement in interacting quantum field theories. So it turns out, Field theorists have a lot of experience considering. Maybe uh, I want to point something here. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So, like, uh, I can understand, like, uh, otherwise, this perturbative description will not valid for the S matrix, whatever you are saying right now. Now, I'm saying that is it possible this nonlinearities will introduce some kind of chaos or randomness in the system? Because, we, yeah. Yeah. Yes, no, that's right. So, so that's, that's a good anticipation of where I, I think, I think I'm going to address that pretty soon. So there absolutely could be strongly um, random looking or chaotic initial conditions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're trying to capture. Well, let's talk about how we try to capture that actually. Yeah. So, so yeah. in that case, the problem is as far as I know, I have talked to other people, there is no description of chaotic ace matrix till now, because whatever it is, it is right now at the non-perturbative level. Okay, so perturbative base matrix description for chaos, I don't think so, like people haven't studied uh, or, yeah, I, I don't know, that, 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 that's why my question. That's a very interesting, no, I had not thought about that. That's really cool and I appreciate you raising it. I'll have to think more about that. That's really interesting. So I'll show you in a few slides how we've tried to accommodate a highly perturbed, a highly excited chaotic or, or quasi-random initial state. So we definitely wanted to build that in. And I had not thought about, I mean, this S matrix argument was really just to, to appease my own thinking and say, why should we be dominated by forward scattering processes? Uh, that's let's, I, I'll think more about that. I appreciate that. I, I'm actually yeah. not sure. There is second question. Second yeah. question is when we are talking about nonlinearities, it yeah. might not always true that uh, we also, we always look into this equal time correlators at the quantum level. Yes. It might happen that your uh, like uh, perturbation field variable you are considering, they are in different, different time slices. Okay. So which people used to call it at present out of time ordered correlation function. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so the, so that might be an alternative option to deal with this nonlinearities. Uh, yeah, I just want to point that because I'm actually working on that part. Oh, good. No, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. I, I have colleagues who work on these these, these out of time um, uh, time order correlation functions. I've learned about them from other friends here locally, but I haven't worked on them directly. And it's very that's a great idea. I'll I'll definitely think more about that. I appreciate yeah, it. Because recently I have given one proposal to how to calculate at least for uh, phi square models uh, that if you have a, it's just a simple uh, scalar field theory in d seater space. Now, if somebody asks you that there is a nonlinearity in the background, then how you can able to compute the quantum correlation function. Ah, very nice. So that sounds like be very helpful to us. So let's let's talk more uh, sort of offline or later on. I, I, would, I look forward to learning more about that. That sounds yeah. very good. Sure. Thank you. Good. So let's stick with what we've done so far, which, which hopefully maybe then can be improved. But we, what we were building on was a lot of experience among uh, quantum field theorists in this situation where you have, where you're dominated by forward scattering processes. Let's, I'm, that's what we've worked with so far. And that, that seemed to make sense to us as a reasonable way to start. So that actually goes back to the early days of many electron physics and, and molecules back to the 20s and 30s, when people like Hartree were working this out. But it's put in its really modern form for relativistic interacting quantum field theories uh, by my colleague, Roman Jakeef and, and some of his colleagues back in the 70s. And so this is now known as a Hartree approximation. There are many ways to do this, but we, we use the Hartree. 
The idea was to, to construct a dressed propagator by selecting a dominant subset of Feynman diagrams at any given order of perturbation theory, and then doing an infinite resummation of those. So that's what, how it's going to become a non-perturbative and indeed non-linear approximation by picking out a dominant set, not the whole set, a dominant set of interactions order by order and doing an infinite resum of those. And that's a trick that condensed matter theorists have been doing for a long, long, long time. There's a, a lovely textbook of Richard Maddock that talked about many of these things. Uh, the book itself came out in the 60s, I think the first edition. So many of these techniques have been known for, by some of our other friends and colleagues for a long time. And we, went, we thought, how could we use these techniques? So if you go back to your, think back to your, your um, textbook quantum field theory, for free scalar field theory, we can construct a two-point function. Uh, it's related to the propagator, and we can call that the, the, the bare propagator uh, if we uh, neglect interactions. Then we can start incorporating interactions, say self-interactions, and there would be corrections to the bare propagator. It's something you, you've all worked on in your problem sets in other classes. So what we're going to do now is pick out a certain set of contributions to the self-energy. Not every single diagram, but at a given order in perturbation theory, what are the kinds of diagrams that uh, in forward scattering processes should dominate? And that's the kind of stuff that Roman and his colleagues are working out uh, back in the 70s. And it turns out the, these, to be these diagrams that are often called cactus diagrams or bubble diagrams. So these ones uh, where you have um, you know, first order, second order, third order, fourth order, where you, of course there are many, many, many other diagrams that in general would contribute to the self energy at say third order. Let's look at this particular diagram and sum up uh, that subset to all orders. Then you can do this, this it's basically summing a geometric series. You can construct a dress propagator that incorporates certain contributions to all orders while neglecting uh, subdominant contributions order by order. And then you get what's called the self-consistent gap equation. What it really means is you've, you've now created a shifted or effective mass. So it's really like saying that this, these quanta are, are traveling through some medium and that's affecting the interactions. It turns out their own self interactions, but you can think of it as a quantum moving through some mush, some kind of molasses. That's what's capturing this effect of its own self charge, its own self coupling. And that it's rarely gonna have a very wide scattering event. That's that kind of forward processing uh, dominated approach. Now this approximation becomes exact if you have uh, N scalar fields uh, and, and an ON symmetric model. If you had a kind of spherical symmetry in field space, and you have a large number of these fields, then this approximation actually becomes exact. The, the, diagra the diagrams you picked out are, um, are parametrically larger than any other uh, diagram because of the, of the statistics of how many different fields could run in each loop and so on. And this stuff that Roman worked out really beautifully um, in the 70s. However, even if you only consider a single scalar field, order by order, at least for the low orders, you can easily check by hand, second, third, Order and so on, these cactus diagrams are also the ones that dominate. They dominate over things like the sunset diagrams or other popular ones. So if you only include those cactus diagrams and do that infinite resummation, you get these otherwise very simple results at the end. It was a complicated kind of motivation for it, but the Hartree approximation consists of the following. We have a, a series of substitutions. Any time in the evolution equations, you, you would have had a term uh, quadratic in the spatially varying quantum fluctuations, it gets replaced by this dressed propagator, the dressed two-point function. Anytime you would have had uh, three of these quantum fluctuations uh, uh, evaluated, um, appearing in your evolution equations, they get replaced by the dressed propagator times one, um, you know, a sort of bare term. Four fluctuations becomes uh, the square of the, pro of the dressed propagator, five, and so on. So you incorporate nonlinear interactions among these field fluctuations, and yet you see you're never more than linear order in spatially varying quantities. This is clearly not the full nonlinear structure of the interacting theory, obviously not, right? This is an approximation that seems appropriate for weakly coupled quantum field theories. And then the actual coefficients here, that just comes from the Wick contractions. So that, th these numbers here are actually pretty easy to reproduce. So David, I have just one question. Sure. Which is like, here, uh, the representative two diagrams are the one loop and two loop diagrams you have pointed. Now, the thing is, as far as I can see, as we go to the higher order, it uh, uh, the uh, like the num the dependence on the number n it increases, but that will not affect the large and limiting result because. Uh, uh, so my point is, if you take large end limit, it will not diverge anyway. 
I think the idea is if n is finite but large, as n becomes large, the, it's the cactus diagrams that will dominate at any given order because you can have n distinct contributions flowing in this loop and n distinct contributions flowing in this loop. So this, the weight of that, the coefficient, goes like the square of the number of fields. Whereas remember, these are both second order diagrams. These are both the same order in the coupling constant and in h bar. This one, because of the structure of the propagator, you can only have a single n. You have n copies of this diagram, but you, you, this, this field has to be the same as this field for the structure of the propagator. So you don't get the counting is you can have n copies of this, not n squared or n to the fifth. Here you can have n different fields here and n distinct fields here. This weighs more. So to second order in the coupling constant, the one with um, uh, the, the cactus diagram will dominate. And that, ar that argument holds to arbitrarily higher orders. That's what, that's what Roman was showing in the 70s. Ah, okay, okay. No, so that's why it's parametrically, um, uh, um, the, the cactus diagrams are parametrically weighted in an ON symmetric field theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty cool. Okay, so now this is what's often called a mean field approximation. That's like I was saying before, you have a, a, a single quantity, you imagine sort of swimming through molasses, a kind of average set of, 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 um, of, uh, of a back reaction on, it, on its behavior. So in particular, you don't have any mode-mode coupling. There's no uh, coupling in our approximation that would be able to transfer power between modes of different momenta. That's like saying we have mostly forward scattering, not large transverse momentum. Uh, so that's a, that's a kind of nonlinear interaction that we simply don't capture in our approximation. And therefore, for that reason, coming back to a question you'd raised quite a bit earlier, in this approximation, the anisotropic pressure vanishes even to nonlinear order. So those two Bardeen potentials happen to coincide in this approximation. Moreover, there are no correction terms that would mix a, a, a gravitational degree of freedom with our field fluctuation because uh, that would come from sort of gravi gravitational modes propagating in loops. And to construct even a single propagator, even the bare propagator, you'd have to go beyond linear order and the metric degrees of freedom, and we're not. So there's no mixed terms uh, like, a, like a, uh, a metric term flowing with, um, flowing with a matter term here. On the other hand, it is non-perturbative. It's not a perturbative expansion in either the coupling constants or h bar or even delta phi. So therefore, in terms of magnitudes, we make no assumptions about the relative magnitude of the background field, the vacuum expectation value, compared to the dress two-point function. And therefore, in our evolution equations, we include both of these kinds of terms, linear order and metric, but incorporating uh, arbitrarily higher orders in the, in the field fluctuations within this approximation. So then I won't expect you to eyeball all this. We do it in detail in the paper. We then get, we have three kinds of quantities whose evolution we want to track. There are many, many examples of it, three categories that we track. We have the evolution of the vacuum expectation values. We have the evolution of the field fluctuations. And we have the evolution of the metric perturbations. And the parts shown in orange are all the departures from the linearized treatment. If we only work to linear order in both field fluctuations, and metric perturbations and all the terms that are highlighted in orange would vanish from our analysis. The usual linearized approach would leave all those out. So even though we're working only to lowest order in the metric perturbations, their own evolution is subject to some of these nonlinear uh, kind of back reaction terms. Likewise, we can expand the energy momentum tensor in this non-perturbative way. We can identify the energy density in the background, in the, in the VEV. We can identify the spatially homogeneous energy density associated with the quantum fluctuations. And again, this is in that non-perturbative approximation. We can do the same thing for the pressure contributions. So then we can see how the bulk properties of such a space-time should evolve because the modified Friedman equation is subject to the energy density in the vacuum expectation values, as well as the spatially homogeneous uh, non-perturbative energy density in these fluctuations. And in general, we could have had global curvature and all that. Another nice feature of this approximation, one thing that, that really, I think really persists despite all the approximations we've made, is that the energy momentum tensor constructed this way it's itself is still covariantly conserved. So we're not sort of injecting or leaking energy in, in some strange ways. And I think that's actually very, very helpful, very powerful. Okay, so now what do we do with those evolution e equations that incorporate a certain set of nonlinear interactions uh, in a non-perturbative way? So we now are now we're going to simplify and consider only a spatially flat background, and that's one of the things we're working at right now to, to to relax that assumption. But for now, these results we just say for simplicity, let's perturb around a spatially flat background. 
Let's consider a, a sphere of co-moving radius, and we're going to use uh, Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions. So once you put the thing in a box in a sphere of finite size, the spectrum of allowable um, uh, eigenmodes becomes discrete. We regularize the behavior uh, of the two-point functions with a Gaussian regulator. Remember, you know, quantum fields, uh, the two-point functions will diverge if we try to calculate at a single point. Uh, rather than doing a kind of fancy renormalization, which is hard to do on a, a finite lattice, we simply do what everyone seems to do numerically, and put in a, a UV regulator with some characteristic scale, kappa. We're going to set the size of our co-moving box to be a little bit bigger than the initial Hubble radius, the Hubble radius at the start of our simulations. And, there, and we're going to set the UV suppression scale to be considerably um, uh, shorter wavelengths, so longer, uh, larger momentum. So then we can have a spectrum of modes that go from just a little bit longer than the initial Hubble radius to considerably shorter. We want to get structure up to 10 times or so shorter than the Hubble radius to start. That means with that set of parameters, we're actually going to be tracking 120 coupled modes spanning an overall factor of 30 from the longest to the shortest. There are other nice features of this parameterization. The, the uh, amplitude of the dressed two-point function scales in the way you, you would naively expect. It scales like h squared, which is the same value you'd get for calculating, say, the quantum fluctuations of a, of a light field into center space, for example. Likewise, the amplitude of the energy density in the fluctuation scales like h fourth, again, exactly as you would otherwise expect. And now we can study the evolution of these systems starting with an initial energy value about one-tenth of the Planck scale, uh, whereas the energy scale of the kind of inflationary attractor is many orders of magnitude smaller than that. So we're starting with energies much higher than where inflation is going to ultimately start. We don't start all the way at the Planck scale for the following reason. We really want to include robust, real, messy structure on length scales up to 10 times shorter than the Hubble radius. That means the momenta in our, in our spectrum should be about 10 times the initial Hubble parameter. So we want the, 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 the spectra to be consistent with sub planckian physics. I don't know how to describe super planckian physics, and frankly, no one else seems to. So to have a spectrum that's well controlled, where the highest momentum in our simulation is at the Planck scale, not above it, and to incorporate structure on scales that are 10 times shorter distance than the Hubble radius, we set the Hubble radius to be 10 times um, larger than the Planck scale, Planck radius, so that we can include perturbations up to the Planck scale. That's how we kind of, that's the, that's the, the range we were able to, to study. This comes back now uh, to another question about how do we initialize the system. We're, we're going to initialize these quantum fluctuations. We're going to quantize them. They are subject to an equal time commutation relation. But we're going to draw the, the initial uh, coefficients as real valued random numbers from, uh, from certain distributions. So if we were to initialize them in the initial vacuum state, the state of lowest energy, it's often it's called the bunch davies state, that would uniquely fix these coefficients, that alpha would be exactly equal to 1 over gamma, that comes strictly from quantization, and delta would vanish. Uh, and in fact, not only would alpha and gamma be equal to each other, they'd both equal 1. Instead, we're going to treat these as random variables. We're going, to, we're going to respect quantization. There'll always be this relationship between alpha and gamma in every random draw. But we're going to draw the gamma and the delta from, uh, from pretty broad distributions. And so we can actually characterize the departure from the bunch davies state in terms of the average amplitude of the two-point function, as we just introduced this parameter c. We're, we're drawing gamma and delta uh, randomly for each mode of 120 modes to start them off. Alpha for each mode is determined from quantization, so it's really only two random numbers for each mode, and we have 120 modes. And then if you calculate the two-point function or the energy density in the fluctuations, we can then scale by how much, on average, does the um, does a wildly fluctuating initial energy density deviate from that lowest energy bunch Davies state. And that's what we're showing here. So we're going, to, we're going to choose distributions for these random draws for each mode of those 120, such that on average, the energy density in fluctuations could be up to 10 times larger than the bunch Davies state. Again, we can control that, make it even larger still. It's a non-perturbative approximation, but we thought we would trust it up to kind of that scale. And now let's consider, again, a simple model just for kind of proof of principle of our techniques. Let's take a simple single field, large field model with coupling constants of the sort that would be um, expected for a, a real inflationary model. 
for each value of the coupling constant, then we, we sort of march through a phase space of initial field configurations. So we ma made this very large grid for the initial values of the spatially homogeneous uh, mode, the kind of zero mode, both its initial uh, amplitude and its initial velocity. So now we have a large grid at each point of which we're gonna be uh, uh, randomly initializing these 120 fluctuation modes. So for each grid point, all of these grid points uh, for the background uh, phase space, we then computed 34 simulations. One with all these fluctuations just turned off if we just simulate a spatially homogeneous system. One with the quantum fluctuations initialized in that unique bunch davy state, the lowest energy, the so-called vacuum state. And then 32 random draws, 32 initializations for each grid point in which the fluctuations for each mode are drawn in this, with these random numbers. That adds up to about a, a quarter of a million individual simulations. This is what, why we couldn't do the full numerical relativity, right? This took two days to run in the cloud. It cost me 60 bucks. It's really not so bad, actually. The cloud computing has become quite extraordinary. So we ran a quarter of a million simulations for two different values of the coupling constant and this grid each for each grid point doing 32 draws of these 120 randomly initialized fluctuations. So here's a typical example uh, out of all those quarter of a million. Let's start with the initial kinetic energy in the background field several thousand times larger than the initial potential energy. We're starting very far from an inflationary state for the background. Let's start with the power of the fluctuations equal to the, to the energy density of the background. So now again, a non-perturbative approximation, there's no re reason to assume that this is somehow perturbatively smaller than that, let's set them equal. We, and, and choosing parameters such that the initial Hubble uh, parameter is about one-tenth of the Planck scale, and it's gonna be about 100 times larger than the value once the system finds the inflationary tracking. So here's one example of the 32 random draws. You can then inverse Fourier transform from the uh, K space fluctuation modes that source the metric perturbation, put it back into position space. Here's an example of what, uh, of the, of what space time looks like on this initial hypersurface, where here's this spatial, um, spatial, spatially varying metric perturbation. It has clear, highly non-symmetric structure on scales up to 10 times shorter than the Hubble radius, the initial Hubble radius shown here in blue. We wanna see does a space time like that with extremely large amplitude perturbations. Remember, uh, psi of 0.4 corresponds to one minus two times that in, in the metric. So you're almost, uh, you're getting close to a kind of coordinate singularity, frankly. So could a space-time that highly inhomogeneous nonetheless flow into inflation? So then you can evolve 120 coupled modes for the field fluctuations, the corresponding evolution of those metric perturbations, we can consider that get curvature perturbation R, the one that at linear order is that gauge invariant quantity that we can compare with the bumps on the sky. And now we can actually make sense of this uh, in, in more detail by looking at, uh, by some analytic understandings of these highly nonlinear results. So here's an example where we're starting with most power of the fluctuations on short distance scales, remember that very royal um, uh, short distance uh, non-uniformity is like saying that most power is on scales with modes that are within, initially within the Hubble radius. During that time, it's the, the, the radiation, the, 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 excuse me, the, the quantum fluctuations are behaving mostly like radiation. They're nearly massless. There's a lot of them on, on high momentum states. It turns out, not putting this by hand, but just the numerical evolution of this coupled system, the energy density of the fluctuations Red shifts very much like radiation, not exactly like radiation. We have these real numerical features, but on average in early stages, it's gonna decay away, sorry, like radiation. Meanwhile, while the energy in the, in the homogeneous mode, the zero mode, remains initially kinetic energy dominated, it has a very different equation of state. It will evolve, uh, it'll redshift uh, like one over A to the sixth. So therefore, if you only had a homogeneous universe filled with kinetic energy dominated scalar field, that just classically, you'd expect the Hubble parameter to redshift like A to the, to, uh, the minus third. That's this red graph here. And indeed, our simulations reproduce that. When we turn off the fluctuations, we find the bulk behavior falls, uh, radiates at early times like one over A to the third until you find that inflationary attractor. When you turn on very large amplitude, uh, short wavelength fluctuations, the whole system is dominated by that, by that source first and the energy density redshifts more like radiation 
uh, rho falls like a to the fourth, h falls like a, one over a squared, and you find that. And if you have the bunch Davies in between, so fluctuations but of smaller initial amplitude, you get a kind of intermediate behavior. And this matches, this is consistent at least, with again the much more sophisticated numerical relativity simulations, for example, by William East's group or, or by Katie Clouds. So when they start their simulations in a highly, highly excited state where you're dominated by short scale fluctuations, highly, highly inhomogeneous initial conditions, again, you find the, 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 the lattice averaged energy density scales like one over uh, a to the four, that's like what we're finding here. The lattice averaged expansion rate scales like therefore whatever a squared, and that's like our version here. So we find congruences in the kind of gross spatially averaged behavior of these two systems, even though we're ignoring a lot of the nonlinear structure that they in principle could, in could include. Now, what about the time scales? Here I'm showing what's called the, the slow roll parameter epsilon. It's a measure of how quickly the Hubble rate itself is changing. Now, it just takes a moment of algebra to find that when this parameter epsilon is less than one, that corresponds to an accelerating phase. That's when inflation starts, accelerating of the scale factor. If epsilon is greater than one, you're, you're not yet uh, inflating. So we're looking at the behavior of this epsilon parameter once we start the simulation with very highly excited short distance uh, inhomogeneities. And we find that at early times, the system is not yet inflating. It's expanding, but not inflating. The system in this instantiation will begin inflating after about two e folds worth after the scale factor is grown by the equivalent of e squared. Uh, it's not yet in slow roll, it's, it's accelerating but not in slow roll. It will hit slow roll which, by which we consider uh, about um, uh, this parameter epsilon being one tenth or below. That happens about one e fold later. During all that time, we still have most of the power and fluctuation still within the Hubble radius. They have not yet scaled outside the Hubble radius. The UV regulator scale doesn't cross outside the Hubble radius until, in this case, an n of about six. And the, and the shortest wavelength mode on our simulation is even still then in the box. It only leaves the Hubble radius at uh, n of about seven. So the system has found the slow roll inflationary attractor while the majority of power is still within, within the Hubble radius. The system, even with a still very lumpy Hubble radius patch, is nonetheless, in this instance, finding the inflationary tractor anyway. Uh, and then we can trace the evolution system all the way through and see when does inflation end, uh, whether we turn off the perturbations, include the kind of um, uh, um, minimalist perturbations of the bunch davy state, or these large inhomogeneities. And that affects the long-term duration as well. Even that we can make, start making sense of analytically. At early times, the, the, uh, the vacuum excitation mode is evolving still essentially like a massless field. Even when we incorporate the nonlinear coupling, uh, the coupling constant lambda is so small. So in this kind of model, in a large field, weakly coupled system, just, just to get an analytic handle, you can approximate this as massless. So then you can solve analytically for the behavior of the zero mode. And now you can see that in very general terms, it will depend on the integral of h. Well, now let's use what we just learned from the evolution of h when we incorporate or ignore those coupled perturbations, that strongly nonlinear, uh, a non-perturbative effect. When we, when we ignore all perturbations, then h scales like one over um, a cubed, then we can solve this approximately uh, in the homo homogeneous case. When you're strongly dominated by short scale fluctuations, uh, then the Hubble radius redshifts more slowly. You can also solve that uh, for the behavior that's remote in that case. We say the system finds the slow roll attractor when the kinetic energy becomes comparable to the potential energy in that zero mode. And we can go back to our, these are the results of the fully nonlinear simulations, and we can actually get remarkable cl uh, uh, clarity on the fully messy nonlinear highly uh, coupled system just with these very simple linearized arguments for what what uh, physics is dominating at what stages. So we're doing a full numerical simulation and then we can make sense of the results we find in this very simplified uh, kind of toy model just to see do, do, do the trends make sense. Likewise, we can make sense of why we get different durations of inflation depending on where uh, the, the, the zero mode kind of finds the inflationary attractor. And so again, just using the, the, the standard relations uh, to calculate the, the duration of inflation once you're within the slow roll approximation, there are standard techniques for that. 
It depends very simply on the potential and the first derivative of the potential, considering only the behavior of the background field. And again, you can say if the background field didn't reach the inflationary attractor until it found, until the value was of this, uh, this value on, on your phase space chart, then you have sort of less duration on the attractor to continue inflating. You should get less inflation in this scenario if you neglect the perturbations than if you incorporate them. If you incorporate the perturbations, what happens is the slow, the, the zero mode is dragged in its evolution. It evolves more slowly toward the inflationary attractor in this instance. So it, it finds the attractor at a larger value of uh, the zero mode than in the absence of those coupled nonlinear back reaction. So then it spends longer on the inflation attractor. And ironically enough, in this instantiation, you get more inflation by incorporating the, the coupled nonlinearities than if you ignored them. And again, that's consistent with our fully nonlinear solutions. So now we can ask those kinds of questions across a huge range of phase space. Uh, we can say for each value of the, of the initial conditions of the background field, both its velocity and its uh, uh, average value, and we couple all these, uh, these coupled uh, wildly fluctuating initial perturbations, how do things like the duration of inflation, the existence of inflation and the duration, how do they change? So here's now, as we sample um, the RMS value of the metric perturbation across a wide range of the phase space, across that entire uh, phase space, in each, in each simulation, now there's about a quarter of a million of them, the system finds the slow roll attractor while they're still dominated by structure on sub Hubble scales. And again, that's fully consistent with the, uh, the numerical relativity uh, simulations from the other groups. So even in our simplified nonlinear uh, and non-perturbative approximation, the system finds a slow roll attractor when you still have the majority of structure on short distance scales. And now we can go to these phase space uh, questions and ask about the duration of inflation, the total uh, expanse of inflation, when we turn off perturbations altogether, when we include the kind of minimalist perturbations that are coupled uh, nonlinearly to the, to, the, uh, to the background, and when we start with these larger inhomogeneities. So if we fix the coupling constant for one value, these, these plots are actually pretty easy to read. This is like saying, let's just take, turn off the fluctuations. If we start with the initial value of the field displaced from its minimum, it's a large field model. Uh, so it's starting at some, at some uh, positive value up, up the hill, so to speak. If we give it a large positive kick, so it starts like going even further up the hill, then in gen general, you'd expect more inflation to occur. And in particular, the stronger the upward kick, uh, the, the less far up the hill you would have needed to, to, to have started in order to achieve 60 or 70 e folds of inflation. So here you can you know that you can trade off how far up the hill you must start for the homogeneous system with a larger kind of upward kick of its velocity. And correspondingly, if you start up the hill but give it a large downward kick, you, if you kick it hard down toward its minimum, then you have to start correspondingly further up the hill to achieve a minimum value of inflation of 60 or 70 folds. That's where this characteristic shape comes from. What you find when you turn on the coupled perturbations is that you're kind of shearing off uh, the effect of that initial, um, uh, initial background field velocity. So the evolution of the background field when it's coupled, when its own effective mass has shifted, becomes less sensitive to that initial kick down the hill uh, beca because of the, 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 the more complicated dynamics of the Hubble parameter. And so in fact, you're less sensitive to um, either a strong kick up the hill that helps you less, but a strong kick down the hill hurts you less, so to speak. And likewise, when we reduce the value of the, of the coupling, even closer to what's mandated by the CMB uh, measurements, then you get an even larger effect, that the perturbations have a more exaggerated effect on your phase space. This is showing the same version of those plots now. Um, you can now average over 125,000 uh, instantiations for this value of lambda, a separate 125,000 instantiations for this value, and now you can do real statistics. What's the average value and the two uh, sigma variations for each point in phase space? And again, it's the same kind of argument that uh, you can get uh, sufficient inflation to address those cosmic uh, quandaries, flatness, horizon, and so on, uh, across a, a, a the region of phase space that you would lose uh, in, in, with a large initial velocity, 
is actually exactly compensated by the phase space that you gain back uh, for a large down the hill uh, initial velocity. There's actually a conservation in phase space. This is astonishing to me. A conservation in phase space of the regions of the projected phase space of the regions that would allow you to get um, sufficient inflation when you incorporate the, these short distance, highly excited uh, initial states. So uh, states that would have given you sufficient inflation here do not until you get all, all the way over here to a slightly larger value of the initial zero mode. Oops. And yet, uh, if you had a large uh, negative initial velocity, sorry, large negative initial velocity, the opposite effect happens. You would have needed to have be all the way up the hill up here to get sufficient inflation. Now it can be all the way down here and so on. So the effects of these large inhomogeneities are symmetric for the absolute value uh, of this uh, initial value for the zero mode velocity. What the, and that scales with H naught. What else scales with H naught? Both the power in the initial fluctuations and therefore the larger metric perturbation. So ironically, a larger initial inhomogeneity can actually give you more likelihood for inflation in some regions of phase space, even though it gives you less likelihood in other regions and such that they actually exactly counterbalance. So you have this, phase, this projected phase space conservation. That's the sort of thing that we never would have found yet from this otherwise very beautiful uh, numerical relativity simulations from the other groups because it's just too numerically expensive to do 100,000 or 200,000 runs and really try to explore a phase space uh, of initial conditions. So I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, we've gone quite a long time, so I'll, I'll pause here and we can talk and then uh, we can talk about reheating uh, informally if you'd like to, but I'll pause the, the main formal part here. So the onset of inflation for these large field models appears to be robust, consistent both with the, with the fully numerical relativity results and even, even with our approximate uh, system. Even when we start with quite significant homogeneities on characteristic length scales that are considerably shorter than the initial Hubble radius. By adopting this particular uh, non-perturbative approach, we incorporate certain kinds of nonlinear interactions, by no means capturing the full nonlinear structure of the Einstein field equations, but we can try to kind of calibrate or check in regions that overlap with the fully non-relativistic, uh, excuse me, with the fully non-linear relativistic simulations. Uh, meanwhile, because we have uh, this sort of computational efficiency, we can try to explore more systematically other kinds of effects of the onset of inflation. We find this, uh, I think, really beautiful conservation of, of the projected uh, phase space of regions that nonetheless yield uh, sufficient inflation. So we have many steps that we're now in the middle of. Let, let's extend to non-zero uh, spatial curvature of the background metric, which is actually much easier for us to do than for the more sophisticated numerical relativity models. Let's check a wide variety of small, small field models, much as what the earlier question suggested. We can generalize to multi-field models and so on. And so that gives us a handle for how to try to uh, quantitatively and systematically address some of the nonlinear physics questions before we get to this very beautiful linearized analysis. There's a lot of work um, on what happens at the end of inflation that, again, I'd be very glad to chat about, but I know I've spoken for a long, long time. So I want to pause and ask if there are any, any questions on any of that. Swagat, do you have any question? <coughs> I don't know whether the, I think only one people is there. Yes, I don't mean to put you on the spot and force you to ask questions. I'm happy to chat more if, people, if you do have questions though. If not, that's okay too. So you want to continue or you want to stop here? I'd be very glad to. I'll go quickly um, just, just to sort of lay out um, at least some of the work we've been doing. There's a lot more work that's been done by the whole field on the reheating phase, but again, still many really juicy questions remain. So in hopes that this might be of interest uh, for some folks, I'd be glad to say more. Should I, go, should I keep going? Yeah. Okay, great. So let me talk then about some of this work on the end of inflation, which again is, is, uh, 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 involves a lot of nonlinear physics. So again, there are three main parts here, and I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly. And again, please feel free to jump in with any questions. So here I want to talk about what, what has to happen by the end of inflation or any modified early universe scenario in order to preserve the many successes of the, Big Bang, of the standard Big Bang model, including things like Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So some things have to happen early in the universe, no matter what might have happened during inflation or, or frankly, anything else. 
Uh, and then what happens in, again, quite generically in, mo in models of inflation during this highly um, uh, nonlinear physics at the end of inflation? And what are the characteristic time scales of these inherently nonlinear processes? So we have these now two really quite, um, I think quite lovely, robust ways of accounting for very early universe physics, the period of something like uh, early universe inflation. We have ways of, of, of characterizing predictions from that, uh, from that early phase and comparing them with, with observations. Likewise, we have um, this other great success like Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Turns out uh, these phases are near to each other compared to where we sit today. They're both early universe, but they're nowhere near each other uh, in, in, the, in terms of the timescales kind of natural to each of these domains themselves. So inflation will be happening at a very high energy scale, very, very short characteristic timescales for the dynamics. Big Bang nucleosynthesis is happening at an exponentially lower energy scale than, than inflation, uh, exponentially longer dynamical time scale, one second, you know, tens of seconds, minutes, and so on. And what happens in between? How do we preserve these kinds of very robust theoretical predictions and empirical successes when we've characterized so far a vastly different era or epoch of cosmic history? What, what might connect these two epochs? And in particular, what has to happen after inflation or any other modified early universe in order to set the conditions for things like Big Bang nucleosynthesis? So what has to happen for the standard Big Bang scenario to take hold? There are at least three things that have to, have to happen during the so-called reheating phase after the end of inflation. The universe must become filled with matter that's in a radiation dominated equation of state. It can't be pressureless matter like marbles or rocks. It has to behave like radiation to a high degree of, uh, of accuracy. We somehow have to have a universe filled with the stuff that's gonna make us and make everything else we see, at least standard model particles. Maybe this is a source of dark, the dark matter sector as well. And it also has to bring all that roiling, messy kinds of matter that behaves like radiation. It has to achieve thermal equilibrium at some appropriately high temperature, much higher than the temperature of the nuclear reactions associated with a Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So the temperature would have to be at least higher than ones or tens of MeV and probably much higher than that. All these three different things have to happen after inflation. They might happen very differently and on very different time scales, but they all ha we have to check each of those boxes to retain the successes of the standard Big Bang. It also is important for even retaining these successes of inflation, or at least for retaining the close match that we now rightly celebrate, I rightly celebrate, between predictions from inflationary models and these high precision uh, CMB measurements. What we're really doing when we compare predictions for the behavior perturbations that cross outside the Hubble radius during inflation, they cross back inside the Hubble radius around the time uh, that the CMB photons are first released, we have a mapping. Remember, at least for many models, the, the perturbation remains frozen between this period and that period. So by making measurements of the uh, of pattern and the distribution of perturbations here, we can infer the physics that was, would have been going on at a particular stage of inflation much earlier on. That makes assumptions about the expansion history of the universe between the time when those modes crossed out inflation ends and we map onto the radiation dominant expansion of the standard Big Bang. What if there were some intermediate phase between the end of inflation and the, and the establishment of those Big Bang conditions? What if the universe expanded for some non-trivial period, not like radiation at the end of inflation, but like something, something like matter dominated or frankly anything else? If the equation of state were not that of radiation, very soon after the end of inflation, you'd have a different expansion history in between the end of inflation and the release of the CMB. And then when we trace back our measurements of the CMB last scattering surface and make inferences about the behavior of, of the universe when those perturbations first crossed outside the Hubble radius, we'd be mapping to a different era. The perturbations we measured would not, be, uh, would not have crossed out the Hubble radius here, but would have crossed outside during some other time. So we have to be careful about the, 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 the characterization we've made of these inflationary origin perturbations. We make measurements about them here. We make inferences about when during inflation, what conditions during inflation they're telling us about. And if in between the universe expanded with some different kind of expansion history, that mapping could be thrown off. We can again be quantitative about that. The uh, what's called N star, the, the number of E folds before the end of inflation 
when these cosmically relevant perturbations first cross outside the Hubble radius, meaning this point versus that point. That depend, we can parameterize that on a number of things. It depends, among other things, on the duration of reheating, which is, say, the time after the end of inflation bef uh, until a radiation-dominated equation of state has emerged. That's now often called N reheating, number of E-folds, until the equation of state has achieved that of radiation. And that matters because many of these very sensitive tests that we can now measure to better than percent level accuracy from uh, the Planck data and otherwise, they actually depend in our theoretical predictions on this pivot scale, or rather on the time during which that pivot scale crossed outside the Hubble radius. So if there's a large uncertainty in the duration of reheating until the universe became radiation dominated, that will start to impact the matching we try to do, the comparison we do between primordial spectra and the now very, very precise data we have on the CMB. So this really matters. Understanding the reheating epoch is important, not just for generalities like preserving the successes of nucleosynthesis, it matters even for our very, otherwise very precise matching or, or comparison with high precision data. Okay, so what happens at the end of inflation to make a hot universe in a radiation dominated equation of state? The original idea goes all the way back again to the earliest days of inflationary uh, model building from several authors. You, you've seen, uh, you see the references here. The original idea was to consider single body decays. Inflation is driven by some inflaton field, some, some scalar field that was, we can simply call phi. If it's coupled to any kinds of, of other forms of matter, these could be fermions or vectors or scalars, whatever they are, there's gonna be some likelihood for the inflaton particles to decay into these uh, decay products if there's some, say, um, three-legged interaction like this. So you can just work to tree level uh, with, your, with your Feynman diagrams, calculate the decay rate for a massive inflaton to decay into uh, you know, decay products. It will depend on the coupling constant and on the mass of the photon. So that gives you one rate, a decay rate. How, uh, how frequently would an inflaton particle decay into these decay products? You have a different rate to consider, the expansion rate that's given by uh, the Friedman equation. We know that in general, for a universe filled with radiation, for a universe filled with radiation, uh, the energy density goes like the fourth power of the temperature in equilibrium. So you can ask when these two rates are comparable, when the decay rate is comparable to the expansion rate, uh, then that should be uh, the time when the inflaton is efficiently dumping uh, its energy into these decay products. If these decay products are light, they'll behave like radiation. So you can estimate a reheat temperature. I, th I think of this as uh, trickle-down reheating. This is like every inflaton boson for itself. It's treating single particle decays of each individual inflaton particle and treating each inflaton as decaying sort of uh, separate from every, every other one. It's like every boson for itself. What was discovered in the mid 1990s is that there actually can be very highly non-perturbative collective effects in the behavior of the inflaton near the end of inflation. There's an inflaton condensate, it's like a Bose-Einstein condensate. You can have all kinds of collective behavior rather than individual bosons decaying one at a time or independently of each other. So you can have sort of inherently quantum mechanical uh, Bose-Einstein statistics kinds of effects. The, uh, the condensate that was driving inflation can actually oscillate coherently at the, end of, at the end of inflation, oscillate around the minimum of its potential, and that can set up these non-perturbative resonances that will never be captured by those kind of single body Feynman diagram type decay rates. This is, uh, many people had, had found this early on, one of the most compelling analyses was done by um, Lev Kaufman, Andre Linde, and Alexei Starobinsky, drawing on a previous work. Uh, I wrote a, a review article on this some years later. You can find even more recent review articles here. If we go back to that linearized gauge invariant Mukhanov Sasaki variable that reduces to these field fluctuations in, in certain gauges, again, we can study its evolution. During this period when the inflaton is uh, oscillating coherently, the, uh, the natural frequency actually becomes pretty complicated. The frequency of oscillations of these, uh, of these field fluctuations can, have a, can ref reflect a lot of structure. And in particular, it can oscillate uh, quasi-periodically. As the inflaton amplitude oscillates around the minimum of its potential, the natural frequency of these coupled modes will also oscillate. In fact, we can identify multiple kind of um, ingredients that drive the natural frequency, and each of them could have a, a kind of um, quasi-periodic time dependence. 
Now, it turns out people have known since the 18th century, it's really old stuff, that there are general properties of these oscillatory equations when they're driven by a periodically oscillating frequency. So if you can step back, don't worry about the early universe, don't worry about uh, any particular physical instantiation. When you have a wave equation of that form, second order in time, driven by a periodically varying frequency, then in general, you, you can have exponential instabilities. This was found by many, many mathematicians, most of them in France, most of them in the 18th century. And the general statement now we attribute to Floquet. So if you have an equation, a different equation that can be put in this form, then in general, the solutions analytically can be written in this form, where these functions P1 and P2 are themselves periodic, with a period related to the period of this driving function. But they'll have these exponential terms, where if certain regions of parameter space these exponents can be real, and therefore you can have real exponential instabilities, growing modes and decaying modes, not just oscillations of the solutions. And again, with my friends and colleagues, we wrote a general algorithm to, to compute the, the spectrum of these, uh, of these uh, Floquet exponents. If you specify a given model, then the regions uh, in which these will be, not, will be real and non-zero, will depend on things like the coupling constants, the wave numbers, and so on, the amplitude of the oscillations. It, but nonetheless, you can actually sort of solve for the regions in which you would expect to find these exponential instabilities. And in fact, even if you uh, incorporate an ex a dynamical background universe, an expanding universe, th these resonances will nonetheless persist in certain regions of parameter space. So that was identified in the 90s by a number of researchers. And now again, we have a pretty uh, a more general uh, kind of um, quantitative understanding of this resonance behavior. It's inherently non-perturbative. You'll never really find that by that single body decay earlier approach. This, by the way, is related to particle production. Uh, again, as is well known, in a dynamical curved space-time, in general, there will not be a single unique vacuum state with which to measure things like occupation numbers for quanta. The vacuum state itself becomes a kind of moving target. Now, if the system is evolving adiabatically, you can define an adiabatic vacuum for which the particle number would then become an adiabatic invariant. But during these periods of very rapidly oscillating um, infoton condensate, very rapidly changing natural frequency of all these coupled quantum fluctuations, you're very far from the adiabatic regime. And again, we can quanti quantify that with something called the adiabatic parameter, when this is very far from one, when you have a very rapid change in the frequency of these quantum modes, that corresponds to very rapidly populating quanta. The occupation numbers grow rapidly, exponentially, in fact, during these instabilities. People have shown you can do this. Uh, this happens not only with scalar fields decaying into other scalars, but you can couple it to fermions. Now, of course, the exclusion principle forbids you from making arbitrarily large occupation numbers, but any given mode, for any given mode, you can saturate the, exclusive, the, um, the Pauli exclusion principle in a, in a highly non-thermal spectrum. So even though you can't make arbitrarily fermions in exactly the same state, you get it nonetheless a highly um, resonant, non-perturbative, non-thermal spectrum. If you couple the implanton to fermions, to gauge bosons, now you can get the Bose enhancement effect or into uh, multiple scalar fields. And that's the work that I've been pursuing with, with my friends and students now for, for quite some time. <clears throat> So that Floquet theory works unbelievably well. It's kind of amazing, but that's still a linearized analysis. It's non-perturbative. It's not perturbative in the coupling constant, but it's still linearized. We linearize the dynamics to first order in that, say, mukhanov sasaki variable. So it's linear in fluctuations, but non-perturbative in the coupling constant. But there's still a lot of non-linear physics that has to happen uh, beyond linear order in fluctuations. And to study that, therefore, many groups around the world have uh, designed a series of these nonlinear, basically lattice codes, all with different underlying kind of techniques uh, that are kind of optimized for different kinds of systems. These are all now freely and publicly available, each trying to capture the fully nonlinear evolution of these coupled fields uh, during the end of inflation phase. I've been working most closely with Tom Giblin and his uh, code that he calls Gabe. He's worked on it with a series of his own uh, students, undergraduate students, as well as colleagues and, and collaborators. So we work with Gabe. Again, it's freely available on, on Tom's website here. Gabe stands for the Grid and Bubble Evolver. It's a C++ code. 
it evolves, uh, uh, he's modified it recently with his students for this project, so it can accommodate multiple scalar fields, multiple matter fields. They can have an arbitrary field space metrics. They can interact with each other both with, with derivative couplings and with an a, a arbitrary form of the interaction potential you can dial in. But it neglects um, metric perturbations. We're actually now modifying it still beyond that. So the results I'll, I'll talk briefly about now are for a, a dynamical but unperturbed space time, but with nonlinear, non perturbative interactions among the matter sector. So we compute the expansion rate by taking a kind of lattice average of this highly spatially varying energy density. And we're, we're working now to, to relax that assumption. We initialize the simulations uh, by matching these classical, these C number modes to a, to a corresponding quantum distribution. Uh, so we can calculate the two point function analytically uh, for the initial state. And then we match the statistics of that with these uh, uh, random numbers for the classical. Uh, uh, fluctuations. We uh, do all the usual kind of numerical convergence tests and so on. Now we've been studying a certain class of models, models that I find really very interesting. And I think they include multiple features that are that are well motivated uh, theoretically. So even the standard model of particle physics includes multiple interacting scalar fields. We often think about only the single scalar field, the Higgs field, but actually in renormalizable gauges, even the standard model Higgs sector incorporates four distinct interacting scalar degrees of freedom. The Goldstone modes remain in the spectrum in any gauge that's reliable at arbitrarily high energies, as we normalize them. So even our beloved standard model has multiple interacting scalar fields, and every single considered beyond standard model uh, theory includes even more scalar fields, any kind of supersymmetric uh, model, let alone supergravity or string inspired. We're sort of awash in these, scale, in these interacting scalar fields, at least according to our friends who work on generalizations of the standard model. Likewise, any self-interacting scalar field that's evolving in a curved in a dynamical space-time will generically, unavoidably, uh, have induced for it these so-called non-minimal couplings, that, uh, terms that appear as phi squared r in the effective action with some dimensionless pra uh, parameter called the non-minimal coupling. Even if C, this coupling is, is vanishes at tree level, even if, it, if you arrange for it to vanish for the, the kind of classical action, they're induced uh, by quantum corrections of the first order. And in fact, you need these terms for any sort of successful renormalization of interacting scalar fields in dynamical space time. Again, that's been well known for decades. Modern textbooks treat this very, very nicely. Another feature that's a little, you have to work a bit harder to find, other colleagues have shown this, is that in general, the beta function, the flow of these dimensionless coupling constants in general is positive. That's to say, as you consider higher and higher energy processes, the strength of this coupling in general tends to rise with no UV fixed point. It becomes arbitrarily strong at arbitrarily high energies. So if we're considering a high energy early universe scenario with self-interacting scalar fields, we should in general consider several scalar fields each of which has some non-trivial, non-zero, non-minimal coupling. So that's the framework for these models that I've been considering with, with my friends and my students now for many years. We build models in the so-called Jordan frame where these non-minimal couplings are explicit, multiple scalar fields. We can then perform a conformal transformation to make the gravitational sector look canonical. We, choose, we strategically choose our conformal factor to, to absorb these nominal couplings in the original action. Then we get an equivalent action in the Einstein frame, where now we've made gravity look canonical, but with a cost. We've traded the non-standard gravitational sector for an unavoidably non-standard uh, um, kinetic sector. I actually showed some years ago the, the, we, we necessarily induce a curved field space manifold. If you have two or more of these scalar fields, each with a non-minimal coupling, then in general, this, uh, this field space manifold after the conformal transformation must be non-flat. Uh, and in fact, you can calculate it. It's uniquely determined by the form of the non-minimal coupling. Likewise, the effective potential in the Einstein frame gets stretched by that conformal factor. Okay. 
So now we can start with the Einstein frame action, which covers a wide range of types of these multi-field interacting models, many scalar fields. We can write down the equation of motion in general. And now Tom only needs this. When we, when we use Tom's magical machine, his Gabe uh, lattice solver, we then don't have to separate the field into uh, background and fluctuations, which is going to simulate a bunch of these coupled fields that in general vary across uh, the lattice points. So all the work I've done with my, with my students in linearized perturbation theory becomes sort of irrelevant for Tom and his magical machine, Tom Giblin and his students, um, because they're going to simulate the full lattice dynamics uh, of these coupled uh, systems. We're now specialized to just a two field system for simplicity, just that already shows a lot of these multi-field dynamics. We'll then uh, fix the form of the Jordan frame quantities. Each field has a nominal coupling. The parameters themselves need not in general be equal, just as their own self-couplings might not be equal. They're going to directly talk to each other, but otherwise have some self-couplings as well, a very generic Jordan frame potential. And that determines all the dynamics uh, in the Einstein frame. So now we have lots and lots of moving parts. Even just with two scalar fields, we have many, many parameters to, to think about, to wonder about. So what we did in these recent papers, now I'm talking about these works here especially, and these uh, earlier semi-analytic treatments, is let's fix the, the, uh, the ratio of parameters that's most closely constrained by the CMB. It turns out in these models, it's this ratio of the five fields self-coupling to the five fields non-minimal coupling squared, that's what enters into the dominant term, the most important term for the linearized power spectrum of these primordial perturbations. That's what's constrained by the, by the uh, primordial uh, spectrum. Fix that ratio once and for all, and then vary the remaining parameters to a series of kind of interesting possible cases. We have, there's a kind of um, typology of all the scenarios that would fit within this family of models. By fixing certain ratios of couplings, then you're fixing a, an instantiation of the model, and then you can vary the size of those couplings. That was how we tried to organize this very large parameter space. And now we can ask about characteristic time scales during which different inherently nonlinear processes will unfold. So when will you, will you no longer capture the interactions using things like fancy flow K theory? which had only been linearized in the perturbations. And there are multiple different kinds of nonlinear physics to think about. There'll be some characteristic time scale during which the back reaction from these amplified fluctuations begins to really change the evolution of the zero mode of the spatially homogeneous infoton condensate. That's one kind of time scale which goes beyond linearized analysis. When do the quantum fluctuations change the evolution of the zero mode? When do the quantum fluctuations become comparable in magnitude to the zero mode? That could happen at a different time. When do the fluctuations in the infoton field itself, short distance, a high momentum quanta of the infoton field, when do those get excited by the rescattering from the populated fields of your secondary field? That's a different kind of process that's also missed in linearized analysis. But these, these are all different nonlinear processes that in general can happen on different time scales. That's the kind of thing we were then tracking in these recent numerical simulations. Different kinds of nonlinear physics with different characteristic scales and how do those scales vary uh, across parameter space. Uh, there are other kinds of, of uh, nonlinear processes that are more closely related to the observables we care about for things like uh, the bulk properties of the universe after inflation. When does the majority of the energy density get drained out of the infoton and into these um, uh, radiation-like modes? What's the scale to transfer the energy? And what's the separate kind of scale to get to a radiation-dominated equation of state? Again, you can ask that as you vary the parameters and so on. This is a, a nonlinear physics you'll never get to in linearized analyses, and it varies by model and by parameter, but it varies within ranges we can now begin to quantify and compare. So those are the distinct timescales of different kinds of inherently nonlinear physics. Then you can compare for a, for a certain model, let's fix the ratios of parameters and then vary the one parameter that's left. So we can see a parameter sweep for one of these models and see these different kinds of timescales, different kinds of, of, of nonlinear processes unfold on distinct timescales. They all, have, however, happen to occur within say one to three E-folds after the end of inflation. So even for very weakly coupled versions, we tune this coupling all the way down to be one, we nonetheless are finding all these things are kind of completed within about three E-folds. 
as we tune that coupling to be stronger and more like models that are quite familiar, like Higgs inflation, a very beautiful, very economical model, where this coupling is actually large, we find these nonlinear processes complete correspondingly more quickly. And that same general pattern holds now across all these different kind of varieties, these different versions within this large family of models across the range of parameter ratios, across the range of parameter values. We can now do all these kind of mix and match. We find that each of these distinct nonlinear processes complete by these lattice simulations within the first one to kind of three or three and a half e-folds. Reheating happens in these models quickly. Different processes each happen and each happen correspondingly quickly within about one to three e-folds after the end of inflation, which did not have been the case. We didn't know that until we ran these large series of simulations. We also can track the onset of thermalization. We can't track real thermalization. In fact, we're, we're, we're simulating classical fields on a classical lattice. We should never expect to find a Planckian distribution. However, we do find a, a kind of transfer of power and a smoothing of the distribution that's at least consistent with a kind of Maxwell-Boltzmann or classical equilibrium distribution at later times. And again, even that smoothing of the spectra happens on characteristic timescales uh, within one to three e-folds, depending on the kind of parameters, it happens pretty quickly. This inherent nonlinear rescattering that can help smooth out an uneven spectrum, the amplitude of power at some length scales different than others, that gets smoothed to the kind of thermal distribution we would uh, expect to see, that emerges pretty quickly from inherently nonlinear physics. So again, to wrap up this part, I was pretty quick. I'm sorry it was so quick, but it's been really fun to work on that. To preserve the successes of the standard Big Bang, the energy density that had driven inflation has to get out of the inflaton, has to be dispersed into stuff more like what we're made of, and that has to happen pretty quickly. It has to not only get out of the inflaton, it has to get into a thermal bath that will expand like radiation and that will eventually thermalize at an appropriately high temperature. We can track the early phase of preheating remarkably accurately in linearized perturbation theory. These gauge variant tools that we've inherited now since the 80s, they work great for the earliest stages, even for these highly non-perturbative but linear uh, behavior. But even those very cool tricks simply uh, won't get us all the way home. So we do have to switch to inherently non-linear simulations to get to these deep post-inflation phenomena. And then we can ask again with some kind of um, generality, how general to whole families of models behave across wide swaths of parameter space to achieve things like a radiation dominated equation of state and something like the onset of a, a plausibly thermal spectrum. So next steps that we're working on now, can we incorporate more gravitational dynamical degrees of freedom within these simulations? That gets hard, but we, we've begun that work. Can we incorporate um, higher spin decay products? A standard model, of course, is filled with fermions and bosons, a gauge bosons, spin one half and one, not just spin zero. Uh, can we focus even more? Can we get smart ideas on how to study real thermalization? And so again, to wrap up over, over this entire very long talk, you've been very, very patient. Linearized perturbation theory is gorgeous and powerful and we should continue to use it. We can use it to make really careful comparisons between robust, interesting physics of the early universe and many kinds of data sets today, but we can't stop there. Both to understand processes that might help account for this nicely linearized regime and to account for the physics after that regime, we have no choice but to pursue nonlinear physics. And then we have to get uh, you know, really careful with an amalgam of both numerical and analytical techniques. And I think that's great for younger people, especially there's all kinds of really cool, really exciting physics to explore with a range of, in our toolkit. And I think that's great. I think it's exciting. We've learned a lot and we have much, much more that hopefully we can all learn together. So I'll start, stop there. Thank you so much uh, for, for your attention. And I'd again, be glad to chat some more if people still have some questions. Thank you very much, David, for excellent contribution. And I am like, uh, I have learned a lot of nonlinear physics today and its implications. And uh, uh, I don't know the other participant wants to ask any question or not. Uh, if not, then. Uh, so, Swagat, you want to ask any question? 
it's okay if not. And of course, you could always email me afterwards. I'd be glad to chat more. If, question, if questions come to mind later, please don't be shy. Don't hesitate to, to let me know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, he's not shy. I don't know whether he's there or not. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, okay, so uh, I'm very thankful that you have given this uh, talk and I will be posted it in YouTube and I will share the link with you and you can share with your students and all and I'm hopeful that other people once see this, uh, uh, they will communicate with you and uh, yeah, like uh, it's, it's very, very helpful because uh, particularly this nonlinear physics, people don't talk about much. Yes. So if you, uh, if uh, since you have given a quite detailed uh, introduction and uh, detailed material of that, so I'm uh, like hopeful that people will be benefited out of that. I hope so, and and, and hopefully they can uh, chase some of the references down. And there's some very good reviews beginning to be written too. Very helpful. Very yeah. pedagogically helpful. That's the, a lot we can learn together. Have, you have pointed all the references, so that that is that is an, another important thing. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, things so stay safe and healthy and and thank you for this contribution. Uh, I will stop recording uh, here.